two of the beekeeping classes. So mm -hmm. thank you again, Jim, for okay. coming today. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just to let you know, the restrooms are halfway down the building if anyone needs that. And also I want to do a little promo for some more events coming up here at the library. So um, <clears throat> there's a seat saving and a seat swap on March 28th. That's a Saturday morning. So there's going to be a, pres a presenter talking about seeds and saving seeds, so getting excited for that gardening season. And then a seed swap, so that is a time where anybody in the community can bring their seeds and share them with one another. And then we also have a presentation coming up on backyard chicken keeping. So that is on Monday, March 30th, it's in the evening from 6 until 7.30. Great. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I, how many people were here last week? Everybody who hasn't been here last week. Okay, okay. I got a lot of information on it and uh, that, uh, handouts that you can pick up and read on your own time too. So uh, last week, of course, I talked about bee biology. I showed that how bees operate. It's a kind of impressive uh, uh, a DVD made about 25 years ago. But man, it shows better than I can ever talk about bees just watching that. So, so anyway, uh, today I want to cover, uh, I want to just quickly review uh, uh, bee equipment, but you need to, I need to get started. So I want to do that. Then I'm going to show the DVD on, um, on beekeeping for northern climates. Now this is a class that I took very good, uh, and we're going to stop at a different section. One nice thing is they, they divide this up, you know, different stages, putting a new, getting new bees, and uh, everything there is step by step, what to look for, uh, when to add new boxes throughout the whole year. So it's kind of telling, it's showing you what you got to do for the first year and for the second year. So instead of me talking about it. But first of all, I just want to uh, uh, show you different types of foundation. Uh, and uh, it's kind of up to you whether you want to use it. I recommend certain things, certain things. You might be able to get a buy, a buy list. So anyway, um, on equipment, I always kind of expect, hopefully, people will buy new equipment to start out or if it, you buy used equipment be very wary about it because sometimes there's a lot of junk out there there's been diseases i've seen and i've seen people spend a half a fortune on used stuff that is uh way too used to uh to keep bees and so i uh, if you're starting out new it's just like uh uh, you want to have a lot less problems than with new, a new equipment. I would basically have used, used equipment, but I've kind of upgraded it as I go. So, uh, and sometimes you just got to throw stuff away that isn't going to be, uh, uh, that is going to hurt the bees. You know, they, they won't do really, really good about it. So, anyway, just briefly, uh, just to show you what is on a hive, this is what you want to start out with. You got to have a bottle. Well, first of all, you got to have something to set this hive on. You can use cement blocks. You can use some. Um, um, you can use cement blocks. I like landscape timbers. You want to kind of level off this. So if you're on a, on a hillside, have it, uh, you know, uh, it's a facing towards or downhill, you want to really make sure you use something to kind of keep your, your hive level. They also recommend that you kind of tip your hive just forward an inch so if, if rain comes, it doesn't wash down here and hold water. So you want it to kind of just a little bit ahead to do it. Now you want to face this to the east and to the south uh, just so in the morning you get some morning sun, you beach down on there, the bees waking up. There's a couple of guys coming in. Do you want to get the doors open? Did you, did you say you 
Yeah, yeah. Just, just a just a very little. And how how long is this? Okay, I don't don't uh, I want to keep it fairly close to the ground. I would not keep it over a foot off the ground, but you don't want it right tight through the ground because grass is going to grow up really fast. Does it help to have air flow? Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't want uh, yeah. You want it so a little air will will get up to it. So yeah, that's what you want. So anyway, you start out with the bottom board, uh, and then uh, you set your hive on there. Your hive will have what they call frames. Uh, starting out, you need 10 frames. So uh, this is brand new. It's what they call uh, uh, a plastic foundation or pure pure This I think I'm saying it right. Foundation. Uh, this is usually uh, depending on where where you buy your your bees at. Um, so anyway, I, uh, there is other different sizes of, or shapes of, or types, I should say, of uh, different foundations. So anyway, starting out, you want to uh, you want to have one one hive. In another month, you need another box like this to set up there. You want to expand your brood. So uh, the more bees, the more honey you're going to make, the better the bees will do. So you need another deep box. Most people. And you can get by with a shallower box, uh, but uh, most of the time, more people use this to help them. A shallower box will be less heavy if you have to move it. So, okay. So on top of that, a couple month, months down, um, uh, you want depending. Well, you, one of the, one of the things you got to do is you got to make sure that uh, the bees are covering. The, um, uh, the drying, drying out the wax, and a lot of times you can can shuffle these frames around to where if on the outside they are not dry, drying out fast enough, and another frame is really dried out, you you can move that to the inside, and uh, especially the first year you really want to draw that that bees by itself. So. Okay, so anyway, uh, as summer goes along, you got your second hive body, it's getting full. Um, you don't have to use this gadget, but it's a, um, um, what do you call this? And this one here is kind of dirty. Uh, this is what you call a queen exclude. Okay, so you want to be the queen to stay down here in these two, two boxes. So you, on the second box, you put this up. Okay, the purpose of this is so the, the queen doesn't get up and uh, start laying brood in your super box, which is your honey collection one. So you put that up on top of there. Uh, uh, the queen is too fat <laughs> to, to fit through here, so she can't get down there, but the workers can, can uh, uh, get through there and they will uh, work on the Put, put the honey away, uh, there will not be any brood up there. So anyway, uh, you can take this off after, most of the time after the honey, uh, well, most of the uh, super is drawn out and full of honey, and then you can take this off and maybe you can put another super up on top of there. So, so as you go. Um, another thing you kind of want to do is, uh, uh, um, and the manufacturer never does this. Right about an inch below the hand here, will a one inch hole. Um, that gives a better ventilation. Also, too, the bees can come and go. Most of the time, they're really coming down here, but it helps with the air. The more air there is, the cooler the hive is going to be. And, uh, uh, the bees work better on it. So you need ventilation both on both brood boxes. You do not need a hole on your super. So front and back or just front? Just front. One hole there is fine. And use your one on one inch hole. <coughs> if you need to uh, in winter time if you need to close the hole or let's say you want to move uh, move your bees, I use duct tape and just duct tape it through. You, and you can buy corks or anything like that. 
to uh, to plug up the hole if you want. And usually you might want to plug it two holes in winter time, but you still want it, the top one should be open because even in cold, cooler weather, they need air to get rid of, rid of the moisture. Okay, so anyway, uh, then um, I'll show you what. <coughs> okay. Now this is, a, if you ever buy stuff with this in it, burn it, melt the wax or anything like that. You definitely do not want to use um, um, this in your hive. I mean, the bees won't like it. They might lay around and help repair it, but it's a terrible shape. I don't know if I should pass this around for pretty girls, but I think that's what they had. So, okay, different types of foundation is where I want to uh, go to next. Okay. okay, there's for brood boxes, there's three types of foundation. Okay, the one that Eli, who was here last week, used, and I prefer this, be very gentle with this. Uh, this is what they call print wire foundation. This goes in a deep box and uh, it's all wax with support wires on. Now when you put it in a frame, and you can pass that around, uh, you've got to cross wire it. So when you lift it up, this is really heavy, so it gives it more stability uh, to have in there. So. And anyway, in order to uh, compare this, and this is a lot more work, but I like to do it in my spare time, you got to cross wire. So, and then you uh, put this little uh, strip of uh, wood here that is on there, you just break, uh, break it off, stick your foundation onto it, and nail it in. Uh, to, uh, I use staples to, to nail it in. And then I use what they call a uh, embedding tool. And uh, this is a embedding tool. And what I do with that is, uh, is I, uh, the way that works is I put my wax in there. This is what they call a uh, this is what they call a, a board to, to, hold, to hold it in. So really what I do is, is I heat this up with a little propane torch, go back and forth, and the wires will stick inside the wax. So uh, this is all set and ready, ready to go. So this is a lot more work if you want to try it. I should help you on it a little bit to get you started, but, uh, but for the most part, if you want to build build your own hives, your own frames, and everything, uh, that's what you want. So okay, so that's one type of of, uh, of foundation. Okay, another type is this is what they call durable. Uh, this is a, another type of foundation. It could be either shell in your uh, super or in your brood box. But it's, uh, if it's in a brood box, it's the same size as it's here. Uh, this you don't have to wire. Uh, you, all you gotta do is just insert it, nail down that little strip, and you're all set to go. This one I'm not crazy over um, because there's beeswax on it, but a lot of times if it's cold, this stuff will snap off. So I'm gonna send these to a ground here. So you can take that. Be gentle with it, don't, I mean, it might, if, if it tears, don't worry about it. And that is the other one there, so. This is plastic? Yes. Uh, well, it's, it's wax. Uh, there's a sheet of plastic between the two coatings of wax on there. So that's another type that's been available to, to your bee suppliers. Okay, another one, and is, you don't need friends. You can buy these right off um, 
anywhere off of a, a bee supplier. It usually comes pre uh, pre waxed. Uh, a lot of beekeepers use this because the frame and the foundation are, are all in one. So, but what I've done with this one is I think this one was had been used and they got real funky, you know, uh, just like that dirty one I sent around to. So I scraped off all the way, I washed it off with high pressure and hot water, and then I recoated re it with molten wax. So all you do is, with that is keep your wax melted. I like to use a little hot pot. I, I'll never use for anything else but the wax. And then I just take a brush and just uh, uh, smear it on. If that is lit clean and there's no wax on it, the bees will never touch that wax. So, okay, another thing I like to, uh, let's go over here. <clears throat> okay, this is a honey scooper, and and I'll show you the different, I mean, it's essentially the same type of wax. Um, a lot of times you can uh, assemble your own frame. I suggest you do it right. Uh, use nails on it. It comes in three pieces or four or four pieces. The top bar, bottom bar, and side bar. And you kind of nail them together. Uh, you want to glue them a little bit. Uh, this here strip you break out and then you can put that back on and put your foundation into it. So anyway, um, and this is what you end up if you want to use Duragil. Uh, and then if you want crimp wire, uh, uh, this is one way to do it. Um, usually on the scoopers, you don't need to cross wire it because it's going to be that heavy. And then another thing you want to use is, I use bobby pin because this is, works fine. It helps keep it from snapping out of there, so to uh, pass that one around. Okay, another thing, um, another thing that if you want, and you don't want to extract your honey, uh, this is what they call uh, thin surplus foundation. It's nothing but pure beeswax. So anyway, this is what you, what you buy. This is for human consumption. In other words, you put that, and it looks like this, you put this in the frame, you've got to support this with what they call pins. Uh, these are of, uh, for foundation pins. So the honey, as it's filling up, it won't blow out, and uh, you can pick it up and, and doing that. So uh, this is, oops, I'm going to hold on this. From this, you're going to end up with this. And this is your, what they call cut home honey. Uh, this is some I kind of, sort of laid off in the fall. I might harvest it uh, later on, but what you do is, uh, what I do is, uh, this is for cut foam honey. I have a 4x4 four four cookie cut, you might say, that I stamp four, four uh, uh, sections out of here. And, I, and then I drain them, I put them in a little, little plastic container, and people like honey in the comb. So it's called Petron honey. So anyway, so okay, you let the difference in weight of that. This weighs five, a lot more than what this is. So that's how come you gotta have good frames, good foundation, and everything. And believe me, honey's heavy. So uh, that's how come you should keep your hives close to where you can drive up to or with any vehicle. Uh, don't set them put it on the other side of the ridge in the woods. Where it is because you don't want to carry that stuff for a curtain pin by two. And also, too, if you want, just drag your finger across there and take a taste of that if you want. <laughs> so it, it, won't, it won't bother me at all. So, anyway, those are the three types are a number of foundation. Uh, uh, that is really what you need to go over. Okay. <coughs> so, we discussed the hive. Um, and then I'm going to talk about 
personal protective a tool, a personal tool that I, I um, that you will need for sure. Okay, I'll tell you the purpose of it. Okay. I always kind of keep my tools in a in a, a five gallon bucket. They say, you know, it's like a little toolbox. I can grab them when I want. So I did that. Uh, the, uh, the first thing you want to use, this is a tool that, is, if you don't have one of these, you ain't going to keep me to please. Um, this is a pry bar, it's called a high tool. Um, what bees do is they like to glue everything shut in here and using what they call pro -play. So anyway, the, uh, uh, the frames will stick together. As the, the inner cover will stick on here too. So what you got to do is you got to go in there, break the propolis, you know, and then this is handy because once in a while there's honeycomb up here or more more propolis. So I like to scrape off all of that. This is a combination of uh, uh, crowbar and scraper together, you might say. So this is one tool that that you will need. To have probably most important tool you've got, and it's uh, easy lost in the field somewhere. I don't know how many you got out there, but I always trip over them. Okay, uh, so you've got uh, uh, this is a handy tool to have. Uh, this is called a frame puller. Some beekeepers don't use it, I like to use it because once I get this off, one hand lift for uh, for the frame so I can lift it up. Uh, it comes in handy if you want to, if, if this is soapy, you got bees on it, you, you can brush the, bee, the bees off. So this is another one that I really like to use. Okay, now after the first year, you want to, because there's going to be 10, 10 frames in here. Okay, after the first year, after your supers have drawn out, after this is drawn out, a lot of, uh, you want to go for 10 frames. The reason you want, uh, you want uh, 10 frames is uh, the bees will, uh, it's called critical bee space. It's three inches from quarter inch to three eighths inch. So you really need that keep this tight together um, in, in the box. And um, if you don't do this, let's say you go with knife with a nine frame that are not drawing out, you're going to have what's called bur burpum. And those bees will, will uh, kind of fill it in with beeswax and honey and everything's kind of a mess to extract. So, uh, but then after the first year, you, uh, you can't go down because all of this is drawn out just like what I showed on that thing there on that one super frame. And you want to go down to nine frames. So, so this is what you call a spacing tool. And you want equal distance between it all. And this just kind of makes it nice for the right spacing because you need nice spacing the bees will do better, it's going to be better vented. So you want to have nine frames, equal distance apart, and this is only for drawn out frames. So, Did you start with ten? Huh? Did you start with ten? You've got to start with ten. And most suppliers will study with ten. And then the extra frame you got, just set it off, and someday you might want to use it to break a frame or something like that. You can always stick that in. A former 10 frame in somewhere. So, okay, so this is one I like to do. Some beekeepers, well, they fill around trying to do it. I like to get the job done quick, use it measuring, because uh, uh, the faster you are and the high is better for you and better for the bees, because usually beekeeping is hot. I mean, you're in a veil, the wind might be flowing, but you're not getting wind. 
And depending on the number of hives you have, uh, uh, you, you want to be as cool as possible. So, okay, so these are the, th oh, one other thing we need is a, a bee brush. And this is just more that comes in this kit or you can buy them anywhere. This is to move the bees out. So let's say um, you want to, or you'd like to brush them off a frame because all kinds of frames want to take a good look at it. So, well, gosh, it's all full of bees. So what you do is just go like this, 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 and they get a little kicked off at you. <laughs> but then you want to you smoke them before you do that. So, so anyway, uh, you need a bee brush. Okay, so, and then, this is, before you even do in, even open up the hive, this is a smoker. Use a smoker. Uh, if you don't, you're going to be regretting it because the bees are going to be mad. You want to draw their attention to it. So, okay, to light this thing. Okay, various ways of doing it. The way I prefer is to take a little newspaper, light that newspaper. I go to tractor supply, I buy bedding. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, pine. Huh? Pine bedding. Yeah, yeah, pine bedding. It's nothing more than flakes of wood that they've planed off, uh, and you kind of spread that. that uh, you get that started burning, and then usually you take, take off right away. So you can use that uh, to start it out with, but then you got a real hot flame. Another thing, it, usually if you got, if you are uh, only got one hive, all you need is just uh, the pine chips because they'll burn for five, ten minutes, and that's all the only time you go. I, in the meanwhile, wanted to burn longer because I usually have more hives, and if you want to burn more, uh, you can use any type of wood. They call it a uh, 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 Yeah, yeah, pellets. I use wood pellets on that. I, I buy a bag, a 40 pound bag, and it'll last me for three, year, three or four years. What do you sawdust? Sawdust is, is uh, what do you call it? will blow up too easy. Okay. Uh, that's the thing. I want to kind of have it burn as a big object because a lot of times when you do this, and how would you like to get your spanning burnt off? in the hive, you know, with, with a fire station after that. You want a steady, cool smoke, and you just keep puffing it. Usually the last thing, once you get started, I take a handful of grass. I just pull up some grass, make a little water, throw it in there, and that has, acts as a filter, because uh, 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 the smoke will come through that, it will make the fire a little cooler, but one of the challenges is to keep this thing lit because a lot of times you set it down, you're working with the bees, you go back, oh boy, here it went out again. So you gotta light it. So get a good hot, light it for a minute before you do it. Yeah. yeah, a burlap, I was gonna talk about that too. Uh, you can use burlap too. I do not like, the reason I don't, I, uh, you can't use burlap. But you've got to make sure that it's untreated. Uh, potato burlap or coffee burlap or something like that is okay, but sometimes potatoes have a chemical on them, and you don't want to put a chemical in your smoker to kill, to kill your bees. So, um, and then in this kit here, it comes with a little piece of bur burlap too. Uh, I, I, Think it's a real rip off. So they'll charge you five dollars for a burlap. Yeah. Um, up at the Food Enterprise Center, people call these, there's certain type of organics. Yeah. So they've gotten to give away the burlap. Yeah, yeah. So you can, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. So don't spend five dollars on this. They also, the egg, I mean, I should, I'm not bad about the egg center, but this is the way some companies work. They'll send you maybe a cup full of wood pellets. They want $5 for that. Good gosh, get a 40 pound bag of wood pellets, you know, on the dock and, and for a wood stove, hardwood pellets. They'll last you for, for years. So, uh, watch well, sure you don't get, you know, uh, because 
Some sometimes new beekeepers don't know what's out there. Believe me, I'm a tightwad when when it comes to to uh, do it. Keep is good. So I uh, the only thing I buy is uh, the 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 for for my smoker. I just buy the flakes from Tractor Supply. That works really good. That's plenty for years and years to come. Uh, if you know a carpenter who has got a planer or something, you you can get his planing planing from there. The dryer is better. Yeah. What's the that for? Burning, smoke, smoke. You you want to burn it? Uh, and this will last a long time. I just don't mess with it because the way I got it, it works great for me. A lot of times you fill it up, and my smoker lasts three or four hours. Off of once one once a wood palace get get high. Uh, caution about this is don't uh, watch where your spot your sparks are. When when you get done, you want to dump it on the ground. Uh, make sure you step it out. If weather can drying, weather conditions are drying good, and make sure that you're responsible for putting it fire out. There have been forest fires started with smokers. That doesn't make anybody happy when they got involved with uh, a forest fire or a brush fire when you, when you caused it because you didn't put out some smokers. So, a word of caution. Uh, dump it out uh, and uh, uh, make sure the fire the fire's out or go to the wall or if there's wet grass around, don't worry about it. That'll never burn anyway. Okay, so I think I, oh, a personal, a personal protection equipment, that's a biggie right, right there. Um, there's all kinds of bales on the market, the main ones, uh, this is one I use for, for uh, quick inspections where the bees are in good, good, uh, uh, you know, they're working, they aren't going to bother you much. And most of the time, the reason uh, the reason that uh, uh, you need something out of your head is because 90% of the bees are going to nail you for for uh, going to be in your face because you got ears, you got eyes, you've got lips, and you got a nose. And man, they can smell your breath, and they know where of where it hits you, where it really hurts. So, a veil is one of the most important things there is. Um, and make sure it's a good tight fitting one. In other words, bees will crawl up a place you don't know how in the heck you're getting in, and there's nothing more that gets your attention more than having four or five bees flying inside your veil. So, <laughs> this one here is a real simple one. Uh, uh, we wanted to uh, protect half of your hive. I'm just going to put it on as a demo. See, just like this here. And the elastic will come around that. This is a cooler way of doing it. I mean, unless uh, it's easy on and off, uh, it's fairly cool. You've got your other clothes on, and most of the time, this will work fine for you. So, and uh, so anyway, uh, this is one type of veil. There's a lot of different veils out there. Um, and but beyond the veils is a, I like to use, is a ventilated V2. These are low pricey. I think I paid a little over $100 for this. I apologize that it is so dirty, but this is years and years of grime on it. I just washed it. This is all I can get. This gives me really good, really good protection. Um, I zip her around, I zip her up, and uh, I bet, and wear a heavy enough pants to to uh, avoid the stain. So um, this works really good. Uh, I like it vented because heat is your biggest enemy. You're generating heat. If you got a, uh, a heavy, uh, I mean, you're, uh, are you, there is no air getting through, uh, through this. This is vented, it helps a lot to keep you cool. There's all different kinds of bee suits out there. I used to, have a coverall with this veil on. I found that, oh my gosh, it's so much work to get that over your waist up over it because you spend a lot of time when it's hot addressing. So 
A lot of times if you wear heavier blue jeans, make sure you wear boots that are not open, open toed. <laughs> uh, don't wear flip flops, even <laughs> these. And uh, another thing too with your, um, and I've had this happen, if you can get a elastic uh, to make, uh, yeah, yeah, I like Velcro straps that will go, will go around your legs because I've had bees crawling up your leg. When you got to the, the thigh, you know something's wrong. So <laughs> that's, that will get your sense of really <laughs> Okay, so, and then you want to wear gloves. I always say, uh, I like, you can buy ghosting gloves, leather gloves. You want them fairly long so they, uh, they go over your, uh, uh, yeah, up your arm. You don't want a real short one where the bees can crawl in. A lot of times I do on my bee suit so the bees don't crawl up my gloves. As I go, I, I put my long sleeve shirt or my, my bee suit over them. Now the bees don't get up this here. I like heavy vinyl gloves because they can, can um, I can help a lot. Uh, uh, you've got better dexterity with rubber than with leather. So I like leather. I, but if they're vinyl, make sure they're heavy enough. Don't use uh, Playtex dishwashing gloves or something like that. They might sting through it or cloth gloves. They might sting through it. Okay, so I guess that's all I need to tell you on, on that. Uh, so I think we'll start on the really how to keep these. Oops, another thing I forgot to show. Oh, no, I didn't show that. Okay. Yeah, that's that there. Okay. Any questions at all? You put them in their eyes or anything? How do you know how long to smoke them for? Can you oh, tell okay, yeah, okay. Good, good question. I, you don't need to smoke the heck out of them. I mean, okay. And this will just show that on that. You go up to it, you wait a few minutes, I mean for 10, 10 seconds, you smoke it again, and, and usually when the bees are in there and you're working, you hear this, mmm, that's all of a sudden they're getting their attention, they're moving that smoke around. The theory of the smoke is that uh, they think it's a forest, a forest fire. If your house is on fire, what do you run, run and get out? Your money, your valuables, your treasures. Well, the bees think it's honey. So what they do is they go up and they're gobbling up their honey. Any open honey they want to gobble up. Well, their bellies are full. In other words, in order for them to sting you, they got to bend over and they're too full of honey to nectar to do it. So, so, uh, so that's the theory of it. And, you know, so. Um, uh, that's what you need to do. Oh, okay. Also, too, after you get this up, just lift up the outer cover and inner cover just a little bit and smoke that, too, so they get a real good dose. After uh, about 10, 15 seconds, then you can take it off. And the bees are kind of like, they're paying attention to the smoke and not you. So if you don't use smoke, all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's something here. The, the, the guards will go after you and they will nail you. And the, and the bees are all stirred up. But it's not good for you, the bees, or anything. So it's a calming effect of using smoke. So. so, anyway, so that is all I can think of on that. So, when you go from the 10 breaks to the 9, do, yeah. do you do that just in a brood box? Or no, do you do I, 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 it's better off if you use 9 if you're. If you're, uh, uh, if everything's brought out, you know, the second time, then you can go back to that. Um, it's just for ventilation, really. And that that's the boxes, too. Yeah, yeah, all the boxes, would, uh, whenever there's drawstring, frame, okay. knock it down to nine. You know, and if you've got a frame that is, isn't filled out, most of the time, even at nine, they will fill it out without screwing up mm -hmm. with so you wouldn't start with 10 for a couple weeks and then go in and just... Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, no, um, usually you go the whole season with, with 10 in there, it's fine. Um, yeah, but, but you can, you can 
uh, yeah, who as you can do uh, do that too. A lot of times you uh, just start right away with nine. No, no, you you can't start out with nine because this, the gap is too wide, and they're going to build a bees. A bees will either fill it up with brace foam or propolis, and you want nice straight, uh, a nice straight. Uh, we call it drawn out foam, and you don't want it wavy. You don't want to have things bridging between there or anything like that. So, so, so when, I'm guessing I'm confused. But <laughs> well, when you like, when you know to go to nine, like, what, I after it's drawn out, it doesn't really matter that much. Just so most of the frames are really drawn out, really good. So, and don't worry about it because what they'll do is they'll just extend it. If it's shorter, they will extend it with more wax to do it. You know, so. Okay, I guess anything else? Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you have to paint the outside of the Uh Painting, yeah. Um, if you want your box to last a good long time, uh, you can use paint. Um, uh, you can paint them any color, they don't care. Uh, you know, uh, they're not fussy. What kind of paint do you um, Usually, the latex paint would work the best. It has less oils in it, uh, VOCs, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's much better to have naturally a latex paint on it, too. So. And most of the time, you are better off if you paint them. First of all, they look better. They're not going to weather, um, you know. So, But do not paint the inside of the hive. Do not paint the inside. Paint the outside. Do not paint the frames. Paint your your bottom board. Uh, don't. Do not paint the inner cover. And then paint you. You can't paint the top cover if you want to. So uh, that's usually that. Oh, on the top cover, always you lay the flattest side down. And a lot of your equipment will have a little little ventilation hole here, so the heat can come out and go out. Did you say that the bottom board, the whole huh? That bottom board that the box sits on. Yeah. You, would you paint? Uh, you don't have to paint the inside of it. No, just the outside. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, this here. Uh, you know, the, the board like that's on the table, like that, that thing. Yeah. 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 You can uh, you can paint that. I I would. I would paint everything, but where, where the hive is, don't paint the inside of that. Well, yeah. basically anything that's exposed. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Anything that exposed, it looks better for you. The equipment's done a lot. It lasts a good long time. So it does help to paint them. And last year, you uh, you painted them really fancy. She's <laughs> a hive artist. So you need any artwork done? I know. I, I don't know if bees like any better. They're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, anyway, so. Okay, I'm going to be going on this. Uh, this is uh, essentially the film, uh, the course I took at the University of Minnesota. It's how uh, uh, the few things have changed in there. I mean, this was me 25 years ago. So, it's uh, by Dr. Marla Spivak. She's a. Uh, uh, the head of uh, entomology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I met her. She's a very dynamic gal. She does a lot of research, and uh, so uh, she, she's the main uh, person talking here. So, okay, let's see what we got here. Okay. Something's happening. Oh, there it is.
Please refer to the manual that comes with this tape for detailed instructions and diagrams. I'd also recommend that you read a book on the biology of bees. The art of beekeeping hasn't changed over the years, but the science has. Parasitic mites have become a major problem for beekeepers. I urge you to keep current on the latest approved treatments for these mites. I also encourage you to read the trade journals, attend your local and national bee meetings, and register your bees with the Department of Agriculture. In this video, we'll take you through two years in the establishment of productive colonies. Whenever you see a transition marked by a flower or scenery, feel free to stop the video and refer to your manual. Our system depends on four basic principles. You should select good equipment and a good location. Your queen should be young and prolific. They'll need nectar and pollen stores at all times. And your colony should have no diseases and as few mites as possible. To begin keeping bees, you'll need a suitable nest or hive for your colony. Purchase beekeeping equipment from a beekeeping supply store in your area or mail order equipment from a distributor. Some of the components of the hive will need to be assembled and painted. A hive stand keeps the hive off the ground so your bees stay dry. The dead air space helps insulate the colony in the winter. It should be made of treated wood or be well painted. Cement blocks or bricks also make a good hive stand. The bottom board is the floor of the hive and provides space for bees to enter and exit. An entrance reducer will be used when installing your new colony of bees and during winter and early spring. Follow assembly instructions in the manual. Deep high bodies are used as brood chambers. This is where the queen will lay eggs and the young adult bees will feed and incubate her brood. We recommend drilling a one-inch hole centered three inches above the bottom edge in each deep hive body and using metal rabbits for frames paint. To begin, you will need ten frames for each deep hive body. We recommend self-spacing frames with glue the top and bottom bars. You'll also need foundation for each frame in the hive to provide support for the wax combs. There are several kinds of foundation. We prefer Viragil, but you may come to have your use as few medications as possible. We strongly promote the use of lines of bees bred to be resistant. We've developed separate resources on honeybee diseases and pests, which we update regularly to provide you with the most current information on registered treatments, resistant lines of bees, and alternative control measures. Please refer to our separate manual for proper use of medications. We strongly recommend that you keep current on which medications and treatments are registered and approved for use in bee colonies, and which are the most effective in your area. Avoid using treatments which are not registered for use. You risk contaminating the honey with chemical residues, and your bees and their mite parasites may develop resistance to the treatments if the treatments are improperly applied. Invest in personal gear to make colony inspections easier and to protect you against stings. Wear light-colored clothing or coveralls. Light colors irritate bees less than dark textured clothing. Tie straps around your ankles to keep the bees from crawling up your pant legs. Wear a veil and a helmet to protect your head from stings. Pick a veil that is bee tight, has good visibility, and is comfortable. When you begin keeping bees, you may want to wear gloves, but many beekeepers find them clumsy and prefer to work without them. 
Use a hive tool, an essential piece of equipment, to pry apart boxes, lift out frames, and scrape equipment. A smoker is also essential. Blow cool smoke over the bees to disorient them while you inspect your colony. Smoker fuel can be anything that will produce a non-toxic smoke that won't blow flames at the bees. For example, wood chips or shavings, corn cobs, burlap, and dry cow or horse chips. To light the smoker, place a small amount of smoker fuel into the bottom. Pump air into the pot using the bellows. Make sure the fuel is well lit before adding more. Add some green grass over the top of the fuel to cool the smoke. Be sure to select a good apiary site for your colonies. A good site includes the following features. Abundant nectar and pollen plants within one mile. Continuous source of water within a half a mile. Sparse population. Good air circulation, not in a depression or floodplain. Windbreak on the north side. Vehicle accessibility. Electric fence for bears. Assemble and paint your equipment and set up on location before your package of bees is scheduled to arrive. You'll need one deep brood chamber set up on a bottom board and a hive stand. A package containing two pounds of bees should be hived about a month before the fruit trees and dandelions bloom around mid-April in the Twin Cities. This will allow the colony population to increase in time to take advantage of the flowers when they bloom in May. Position the entrance reducer using the smallest opening. If it is sunny, stuff some grass in the entrance to delay them from flying out. Remove four frames from the center of the high body. Try the cardboard lid off the top of the package. He's playing several lines. Sharply right? wrap the bees so the cluster drops to the bottom of the package and spray the bees with sugar syrup. Remove the feeder can from the package and set it aside. Remove the queen cage from the package and check to make sure she's alive. Put the queen cage in a safe, warm place, like your pocket. <laughs> no, no, she won't stay here or anything. Spray the bees in the package with more, more sugar syrup. Shake the bees into the hive and carefully spread them out on the bottom board, as Dr. Basil Pergala says, like spreading socks on pizza.
feed your new colony pollen substitute until natural pollen is available. Place a patty on top of the frames, but don't block the opening for the feeder. Provide the hive bees with two gallons of light sugar syrup. Make sure the pail is level and doesn't leak. Place a medium depth shell over the pails and cover with the outer cover. The next day after hiving your package, check the feeder pail to make certain bees are obtaining sugar syrup. No need to open the colony at this time. Inspect your colony to determine if the queen is laying eggs. Use smoke during each inspection. That's a one method of feeding. Uh, you can use an in-hive feeder like that over there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can purchase that. Okay, and, and put that in there. They will feed. Make sure you got a little stick in there so they don't uh, run. Uh, usually, if you get them by April, you want to feed them a little bit. You can feed them sugar syrup or sugar even, uh, or even a frame of old honey if you got it. So uh, that's one method of feeding. Uh, once the dandelions are out, don't worry about the the pollen, they're going to be bringing in enough pollen. Uh, dandelions are going to be bringing in a lot of nectar. But uh, so feeding is bad, it just depends on the weather and what time of year it is. So, um, and that, and also too, that's surely a package. Okay, uh, that's one way to buy bees. Uh, and you can get packages if you want. Uh, usually, and I will pass around that before you go home, a list of bee suppliers who already can buy bees from. I would suggest that either I come or that you do it right, uh, uh, putting in the packages. Uh, so, in other words, packages are just bees with the queen with the feeder cannot. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing most, and a lot of other beekeepers have been buying are what they call nukes. Uh, these are uh, are small hives with a new fresh queen in. You get uh, three or four, four or five frames in that box. Okay, I bring a nuke box. It's just a, a smaller box that holds, holds the frames in. Um, you get more uh, more bees. Uh, there's already brood in there, so you don't have to wait for the the uh, bees to draw out the frame. To, for the queen to lay, uh, 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 to start laying. Here with the package, it takes a little bit longer. You don't want to really mess with that uh, queen for the first week. You can inspect it, make sure that the bees are drawing out honey. Make sure that you see eggs or larvae inside the, uh, inside the uh, frames. And then you know what she's doing. If you don't see after a week, a week and a half of any activity that the queen is doing, you've got a dead queen, which has happened. So uh, uh, get a new, a new queen as soon as possible. Because, uh, and then you want to, if you do have to put it in, put her in a cage for three or four days until the workers get used to her, and then you can't release her. Uh, with a package, you can release the queen right away because they already know her because they've been traveling a lot of times to make up the packages in California. Lower my semi bring them here and distribute them around to different uh, uh, to different uh, uh, beekeepers. So, any other questions? Anything? Okay. We strongly recommend that you keep current on which medications and treatments are registered and approved for use in bee colonies, and which are the most effective in your area. Avoid using treatments which are not registered for use. You risk contaminating the honey with chemical residues, and your bees and their mite parasites may develop resistance to the treatments if the treatments are improperly applied. Invest in personal gear to make colony inspections easier and to protect you against
and a half a mile, sparse population, good air circulation, not in a depression or floodplain, wind break on the north side, vehicle accessibility, electric fence for bears. Assemble and paint your equipment and set up on location before your package of beads is scheduled to arrive. You'll need one deep brood chamber set up on a bottom board and a hive stand. A package containing two... When they say sparse population, you mean sparse bee population? And yeah, yeah. And a private part of the you know, uh, if you're living in a city, don't, you know, make sure that... Uh, open air. You're right, right, open air, yeah. You can keep them in a city if you want, but you know, there's that little difference that you gotta watch out for. Sharply wrap the bees so the cluster drops to the bottom of the package and spray the bees with sugar. Yeah. Use your hive tool to remove the frames from the box. Always remove an outside frame first to avoid disturbing the brood nest and inadvertently crushing the queen. Remove all frames slowly and smoothly to avoid disturbing or damaging the bees. When looking for eggs, make sure to have the sun to your back so it shines down into the cells. There should be one egg per cell centered in the bottom of the cell. We recommend you purchase a marked queen. However, as you become more experienced, you may want to learn to mark the queen yourself by carefully placing a dot of enamel paint on her thorax. You will get good at finding the queen eventually. Make sure the frames are properly spaced in the box so that a bee space is left between the frames. This is particularly important when the bees are hived on new foundation. Continue feeding unmedicated sugar syrup until dandelions and fruit trees are in bloom. Every seven to ten days after hiding your package, check the progress of your colony. Bee populations will dwindle for the first 21 days after hiding your package until new workers emerge. Use slow and careful movements around your bees. Notice that the bees are drawing out new wax comb on the foundation. Check for the presence of the queen by noting that there are eggs. Note larvae, shaped like the letter C in the cells, and sealed brood or pupae under a wax capping. Also note stored pollen, which may be very colorful depending on the types of pollen the bees are collecting. Note the queen's brood pattern. The brood area should be compact with few empty cells. To ensure rapid and even comb construction, move undrawn combs in from the edges. Don't place frames containing brood at the edge of the box. Keep all brood frames together. <coughs> Continue feeding sugar syrup as long as the bees consume it. As your colony grows, the bees will need room for expansion. Add the second deep hive body to each colony when most of the comb surface in the first box has been drawn out. When the second hive body is added, remove one frame containing nectar but not brood from the original hive body, leaving nine frames. Most beekeepers maintain nine frames in each box to facilitate colony inspections. Placing a drawn comb in the center of the second box will encourage the bees to move up into the second box. Be sure to evenly space the combs after each inspection. Leave 10 frames in the second box until they too are all drawn out with wax. Remove the cork from the bottom box, but leave the second box plugged until the foundation is drawn out. Adjust the entrance reducer to the next largest opening at this time. Add the third deep hive body later in June, when the bees cover all the frames in the second hive body. Way to 
do that at the University of Minnesota, they use three uh, high bodies. Uh, because it's colder in the winter up there, all beekeepers around here use just two high bodies. So don't worry about that. Also, to the entrance for you. So you want it, when you put your bees in, you want it the smallest slot in there. Uh, probably in about four weeks later, go to the wider one. Two or three weeks later, take that entrance block out because it's going to be probably mid-May to the end of June. They need all the ventilation to get the going to be more bees, so they don't need any, and the weather's going to be warmer too, so uh, they won't need any, um, uh, we got the, the more area to fly, to fly in and out as uh, nectar season, season's growing. Uh, so anyway, they use three high bodies. Don't pay any attention to that. Remove the tenth frame from the third high body when all the frames of foundation have been completely drawn. To ensure that the queen has adequate comb space to lay eggs, reverse the high bodies in your new colony of bees at least once before winter. When the top brood box is filled with bees and brood, move it to the bottom of the stack and place the brood box that was resting on the bottom board on the top. In this way, the queen will be moved to the bottom of the stack and will eventually work her way up again, filling the boxes with brood. Your goal this first year is to build a strong three-story colony for wintering. Your new colony may not produce surplus honey for you to harvest the first year. However, in some years, you may need to add honey supers in July. Instructions for producing and harvesting honey will be given later in this video. At the end of summer, begin preparing and calling. Uh, also too, um, you always kind of want to make sure that your bottom food box, whether it's the one on top, is, I want your queen to really not uh, be in the top too much. In other words, uh, if when you move her down, she's gonna, I mean, I say if you don't move them, she doesn't go down there and you just got empty frames there because she wants to go up. So a lot of times, shuffle around the frame or even the box. So uh, they will keep going from down on the bottom, up, back and forth. So kind of keep those two, uh, Mention that screen. Yeah, we'll show that there. For winter, to winter your colonies effectively, your colony should have a young queen, no mites, no diseases, adequate honey stores. To determine if your colony is infested with mites, shake about 100 to 200 bees into a container filled with isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol. You can easily determine if the sample of bees has varroa mites back at home, as we will demonstrate shortly. To check your bees for varroa mites, place the sample of bees in a 1 8 inch hardware cloth basket over a white bowl. Pour extra alcohol to cover the bees and shake them for about a minute to dislodge any mites. The mites will fall through the basket to the bottom of the bowl. At least you don't really need, I got, I got a different way of doing it. Too. You can easily distinguish the mites from other debris by their reddish brown color and their oval shape. To determine if your colony has tracheal mites, send the sample in alcohol to a laboratory. A tracheal mites are have to set the bees yourself under a microscope. If your colony has varroa mites, you may use various methods to control them. Please consult our resources on diseases and pests for recommended and safe options. Before mid-October, feed two gallons of heavy sugar syrup containing fumidum to prevent nosema disease. A total of 75 to 100 pounds of stored honey will be needed by the bees for the winter. The gross hive weight should be around 180 to 200 pounds. You may need to supply more unmedicated syrup if your colony is light. To 
determine whether the 75 to 100 pounds of winter honey reserves are properly located in the hive. The top hive body should have approximately 40 to 50 pounds of honey. There should be 30 to 40 pounds of honey in the middle hive body and 10 to 20 pounds in the bottom hive body. You may need to move some of the frames in the colony to fit this arrangement. Position the entrance reducer using the largest opening facing up. Plug the two entrance holes in the bottom boxes with corks, but leave the hole open in the top box for ventilation and as an upper winter entrance. The bottom entrance may be covered by smoke later in the winter. Place fiberboard over the inner cover to wick moisture out of the hive during the winter. Place a commercial winter carton over the hive or wrap the hive in tar paper. Fold under one of the flaps of the carton or cut it off to allow air to flow over the moisture board. Replace the telescoping outer cover and secure it with a rock. The outer cover should sit loosely on top to allow moisture to escape. Cut a hole in the winter carton that is aligned with the upper entrance. Your colony is now ready for winter. This method of wrapping is sufficient to ensure colony survival in most northern regions. Some beekeepers prefer to wrap the colonies in styrofoam insulation covered with black plastic. As you gain experience, you may want to experiment with different methods. Okay, uh, they're kind of jumping ahead there a little bit. Um, I, when I winter, I, if I want to keep them outside, I would wrap them with tar paper. The main thing is that will hurt bees is the, mo uh, the moisture that collects in there over the winter. So what really essentially happens is that there's condensation up on your upper cover, and and uh, this is what happens when you don't use an absorbent moisture board on it. And uh, what happens is there's frost on there. You get a 40 to 50 degree day, that frost will melt just from the sun, and go down and it will drown bees like crazy. So the best prevention is to buy a fiberboard, the cheap Newsom handle sheets of, uh, uh, of uh, this old time brown fiber board that acts as a whip. So you put that between your inner cover and your outer cover and that will, will uh, suck up the moisture and the air will do it. I've seen it where uh, it weighs three times more wet. It's a wet, soggy thing. So, but you can use uh, newspapers or I would suggest fiberglass. But uh, uh, sawdust. Some people use sawdust. It works good. So it just depends on. Uh, also, too, for overwintering, I don't do a whole heck of a lot uh, because I move mine underground, uh, half a mile from Roqua. I have an underground chicken coop. Uh, her bees are in there. My bees are in there. I've got 40 bees inside there, and I will welcome more. So your your greatest survival chances are because uh, because you don't have the fluctuating temperatures is to uh, have me come out, remove the bees inside, and they will be happy in the dark. Uh, they don't have to cluster together and uh, they use less speed too for so doing that. Okay, yeah? What do you think of the sawdust? Huh? The sawdust. Oh, I, I would use sawdust. I would use wood chips, I'm sorry. Wood. Yeah, so a wood chip. I just, uh, uh, I just kind of spread them on top of the inner cover. The inner cover. Yeah, yeah, the inner cover, yeah, yeah. And that will work too. So, okay. and some people use a screen on it to help them don't fly all over. We have a lot of deer and raccoons, and yeah. are any of those a problem for bee boxes? Uh, raccoons sometimes there are. I had one raccoon that uh, met his demise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a good strong hive the, the first part of March. Uh, this raccoon tripped, well, they tripped over one of my, I had two hives side, side by side. One was weak, the other was good and strong. A lot of bees in there. In one day it tipped over the weak one, and by the time I got to it, I seen it, I, all the bees were dead, I lost that high. And what they're eating in there is the brew. That, that yummy brew is tasty, so that, that's what they were after. 
a couple days later, I went to, uh, uh, I seen my, uh, my strong hive was tipped over. The bees, I was able to put the hive back together and the bees were okay. However, uh, a couple of days later, my brother-in-law was, hunt was turkey hunting in the woods, and lo and behold, he found a coon, seen in a coon dead, which is very unusual. He said, I want to look at it. That coon had stingers so bad, his eyes were poked out, and uh, the nose on the face of it was so swelled up, it's right to the end of the nose of that coon. So, that coon had a very painful, well-deserved death. So fencing is... Fencing, uh, fencing doesn't do much for coons unless you go down there. Uh, skunks are more of a problem than coons are. Uh, skunks will scratch, they are strong enough to tip it over, and they're resistant to stings. But as soon as the bees come out, they kind of munch on them. So uh, that is one thing about skunks. Um, <coughs> Usually, if you move your hive up a little higher, then the stumps won't, can't reach them. Um, but the biggest thing that is happening is bears. Uh, bears have destroyed hives uh, out by bugs, two beekeepers lost. Uh, some of their hives, because the, bee, the bears will tip it over. I have a beekeeping friend up north of Holman who had a game camera, and you've seen uh, the bear hugging the hive, you know, and it's perfect fit to that. The only way you can get rid of bears is electric fence. I got some from the DNR. You don't have to pay for it. You say you're a beekeeper and you've seen a bear in the area. And if you want, I can give you a number. Uh, seven, eight years ago, I had some down by Liberty, that some hives, and uh, about the fall previously, uh, uh, a bear came in and got in a commercial bee, a beekeeper's yard, took over a lot of hives, did a heck of a mess. Well, this is late in the fall that this happened, and I didn't want to have to, again, because half mile away I had my, my hives going. So I called the DNR, uh, there's a bear specialist from Moss Digitums, and he gave me um, Unbelievable. A solar powered electric fence for, that's good for 20 miles. Uh, eight fiberglass fence posts. Uh, the, uh, they call it a fiber uh, plastic fence. It's got, uh, it's woven plastic with a, a stainless steel wire in it. And, and it gave you a quarter mile of that. Uh, there's clips to do it and four gate handles and a brown rod all in charge no charge, and uh, that's because the bear hunters pay for it with their licenses. So, you know, so that, that helped. I haven't used it yet because that yard uh, over by Viola, a bear was killed by a car and that went nailed that bear. And so nobody else has had a problem since then. But to hear bear sightings all over, just be aware that you might get nailed, and the only way to prevent it is electric fence. We're not like ASMR, so I'm going to sit there and take it. Yeah, 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 you got to use electric fence. As I say, you can, uh, you can uh, get it, no charge to, uh, to the state. Any other questions? Okay. The first thing to do in early spring is provide pollen substitute. You can use pollen substitute if you want. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, a lot of times when you do this, there's going to be pollen up here anyway. This is north, up north of the pollen season. Is, is a lot farther behind here. But once you get the bees out, uh, apple blossoms come out, dandelions are out, they're going to go for and tree pollen. In mid-April, when the temperature is above 50 degrees, clean the dead bees from the bottom board of the winter colony. You're always going to have dead bees on the bottom. Just clean that off, otherwise you just kind of funky smell and how you does bees anyway.
you always want to have the next biggest hole. If your colony has over six frames of brood, conduct a partial reversal. Rotate the position of the top two boxes to provide room for colony expansion. Later in the month, conduct a full reversal. The menu will illustrate how to arrange the boxes. Replenish the pollen patty if necessary. Divide strong colonies about six to eight weeks before the main honey flow. In our area, we make divides during the dandelion bloom. Dividing your colony will help prevent swarming and will aid in mite control. You will introduce a new queen into the new divide, which will help the colony winter successfully. The colony that is to be divided should have a brood chamber consisting of three deep hive bodies, a large adult bee population, and a minimum of ten good frames of brood. A full reversal was performed on this colony earlier in the month. Order a new queen in advance from a reputable queen breeder. At least four days prior to the expected arrival of the queen, arrange half of the frames containing the brood into the top hive body and the other half in the middle hive body. Place any remaining brood frames in the bottom box. Place a queen excluder between the top and middle hive bodies. The excluder will confine the queen within either the top box or within the bottom two boxes. Four days later, inspect the hive bodies to locate eggs. The box or boxes that contain eggs will also contain the queen. If you see eggs, it is not necessary to see the queen. If eggs are found in the top hive body, remove the middle brood box, which is queenless, for the divide. If eggs are found in one of the bottom two hive bodies, remove the top hive body for the divide. Place the hive body that contains about half of the brood with no eggs on the bottom board at a new location in the apiary. This newly established colony is the divide. The unit that contains the other half of the brood and the queen is left at the original site. This is now the parent colony. The parent colony will be the honey producing colony for this season. The new divide will be the colony that winters and will become the honey producing parent colony the next season. Okay, nobody around here does that like that. We have a three hive high body. Usually mid May or so, let's say your bees do real good, they're really uh, both boxes have got honey, there's a lot of brood in both boxes. Um, you don't have to, but I really would recommend it because uh, you, you can make start out with another hive. So in other words, what people do is they look for the queen in, in uh, the two boxes. So in other words, you take, separate the two boxes, look for the queen. If you can't, and I'll tell you if you can't find her, but put equal amounts between the boxes, equal amounts of brood, of, of um, frames of, uh, uh, of honey, and empty frames. So you want equal amounts of frames in both of those hive bodies. Uh, with the, the queen, uh, because you got to know which box the queen is in, uh, and then you separate them. Uh, and uh, within a couple days, you can introduce, a, order a queen, it's going to cost you $25 or more for a new queen, and you put her in the queenless hive body, and you got a new hive, hive going, and you're going to have two hives instead of one. That prevents a lot of swarming. By doing this, plus you have two hives, you're going to get more, more production. 
if your hive is really weak, and yeah, sometimes you get one that, oh my gosh, it's like, well, uh, maybe winter, but it isn't doing too good. Don't divide a weak hive. You just suit yourself in the foot if you do, if you do that. So just let that hive alone, let it build up a little bit, and don't put a second hive body on that one until it's kind of full, until that lower hive box is getting crowded with bees, brood, and pollen, then you can put that second hive body on. So um, anyway, that way you, you can get uh, uh, divide up. I really recommend that's what I do. Okay, now if you can't find the queen, I'm going to look all over. I know she's in there. I know there's brood in there. Okay, what you do is you take a, still take off the two brood boxes. Make sure that there's equal amounts of, of uh, brood frames, honey frames, and frames in each box. Then with one of the boxes, you you uh, take out frame by frame, and you and you brush all the bees down in one box. You might have to take out a couple of frames so so they go, but you're and you kind of do it on a real calm day where it's not too cold, probably 55, 60 degrees is ideal. They will go down in there, and so you're emptying all the frames with uh, with bees on it into one box. Take your uh, take your queen excluder, put on top of that box. I mean, between the boxes, I should say, and all the bees are going to come up except the queen is going to be in the bottom box. She can't get up through that queen excluder. So, and then in a couple days, just take that box off, get a new queen, put in that box, take off the queen excluder, put out an empty box, because, uh, and that is ready to go, and then uh, uh, you're all set. The two, the two, the two hives going. So, okay. Any questions? Well, I try to separate them. Took them to the second vocation. They got flying back to the main hive. It doesn't hurt. A lot of times they'll tell you, uh, I do get actually got to move them three or four miles away in one box. I haven't found that too bad. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's always going to be nurse and nurse bees in there, and there are new bees being born out. It might be a little slower. But uh, if you got them side by side, most of the time, you know, uh, the bees will come and go because they know the smell and the queen cell hasn't been good. But as soon as you get a new queen in there, in the queenless one that's been queenless for a day or two, the bees are, and you put the new queen in there, the workers are going to come in there too. So both, uh, both hives are going to be active. So. How far apart should you keep the hives? Oh, I would, uh, I just, two or three feet apart is fine. A lot of, there's a lot of experts who say, hey, you got to give them away because the bees are all going to go into one box, all the brood's going to die. I've never found that. So I mean, the hives on the pallet, you just move the whole pallet around. Well, yeah, you can do that, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's easier, well, unless you guys put a move a pallet around with, but, but uh, I mean, those hives are going to be heavy. I mean, uh, you've got uh, some honey in there, you got bees in there, so they are going to be probably half the weight of a regular one, but you don't want to have to carry it too far. And moving bees sometimes is a little risky, too. So I'll tell you how, how to move those later, how to move bees. So, so we try to stop that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, some beekeepers who are against buying queens, they want to make their own queen. This is another way of doing it, is you make sure that there's fresh eggs in there and, uh, and, and they raise their own queens in a box too. Uh, most of the time if you take a new box, which is a smaller one, don't take out so many of them and a good strong hive you you can do that with if you find enough eggs and uh, so you get out the fresh eggs that are in there and and the bees know that they're going to be queenless eventually they will make a new a new queen but 
but what's going to happen? It was like, hey, it's the end of May. You only got about two or three months of of uh, of, of a good nectar pool. So by the time you get it, it's going to take you almost two and a half to three weeks to get that queen. You're going to she's going to spend at least another week. Uh, having a, a affair with all the drones that are out there. So, and then and then she's going to come back and start laying eggs. Well, that's going to be another three weeks. So you got two months already shot up the wad to, to uh, before any new, new bees are being born. By then, half the nectar flow season is over with. That's how come I prefer, I want honey, I don't want to raise queens and just have that hive sitting there. I did too much work. I want honey. So you might get a little honey out of there, but not much, but at least you got a hive with a local queen. And then too, depending on the weather, uh, weather conditions have to be really good for a queen to make good. And that's how come sometimes local queens have, have issues with. That's how come I like to go down and buy queens from down south. To get them up here, they're already fertilized, and they've been tested, and they pay $25, 30 for a new queen to get in there, but as soon as she gets released out of that hive, she's, she's going to be an egg-laying machine, and I'm going to get more, more honey that way, which pays off the, the price of the queen. So, okay? Did you, did you get local queens? Yeah, I get my local queens. They're, they're good beekeepers who make queens. They raise their own queens. They like them. I don't have the trust, I don't have the technique or the time to make queens. Making queens is kind of a, a time sensing thing. Uh, there's different ways to raise them. I've never really studied it yet, but. So you, can, you can buy a queen locally. Oh yeah, you can buy queens locally. Yeah, and almost all of them pass out. I've seen most of those B and B honey up in uh, uh, Houston, Minnesota, or yeah, Houston, Minnesota always has queens in stock. Mm -hmm. There's a, a Jordan Bendel down by uh, yeah Gage Mill who who will raise queens, but he's not raising. I talked to his wife yesterday, they're only raising queens, they're not in the honey pitch or anything. Oh, you know what's going on? Yeah, yeah. You can find them if you're on social media on Facebook. Right, yeah. And their queens are usually pretty good. Sometimes you can get a dead queen too, so I sort of have something from the outside that maybe, I like to move them in there. I mean, one of the advantages is that local queens might be a better survival in the winter. That's the main reason for local trade. So, okay, good. The bottom plant body of the parent colony is moved to the top, so the colony has room for expansion. Two honey supers should be provided to the parent at this time to provide space to store nectar. Remove the entrance reducer and corks. Let the device sit from 12 to 24 hours before introducing your new queen. During this time, older bees will return to the parent colony, leaving younger bees in the divide, who will more readily accept a new queen. Introduce the new queen using the slow release method. Remove the cork from the candy end of the queen cage and make a hole in the candy with a small nail. Be careful not to skewer the queen. <laughs> Slightly separate two frames containing brood in the middle of the high body. Suspend the queen cage in the space with the screen down. Center the cage on one of the frames just below the top part. These two frames will have to be pushed together to hold the queen cage in place. Close up the hive. Refill the pail with sugar syrup if necessary. Do not disturb the divide for five to seven days. During this time, the bees will chew through the plug of candy in the queen cage, releasing the queen into the colony. After five to seven days, 
gently over the divide and look for eggs and larvae to be sure the new queen was accepted. A deep, high body, preferably with drawn combs, should be added on top of the divide. Inspect the divide every 7 to 10 days until the major honey flow begins. Add the third deep high body when the second one is mostly filled, Don't as you do for the package. <laughs> when the third box on the divide is full, conduct a full reversal, moving the top box to the bottom and the bottom box to the top. Honey supers can be added to the divide over the third brood box. After the honey supers are added, it will not be necessary to inspect the brood nest until fall. The brood nest of the parent colony will remain in two deep hive bodies for the remainder of the season. This is the colony that will produce surplus honey for you to harvest. It is not expected to survive the winter. Inspect the parent colony every 7 to 10 days after making the divide. Reverse the two hive bodies on each inspection so the queen will always have room to lay eggs and to give you an opportunity to check for swarm cells. Bees swarm in early summer when they are congested. Before swarming, the bees begin to rear queens from a number of larvae present in the colony. They enlarge the cell around the larvae so that the cell hangs vertically and they feed the larvae with large quantities of royal jelly. You can discourage them from swarming by destroying the cells with your hive tool. Continue to perform reversals to expand the brood nest and relieve congestion. When the first two honey supers are mostly filled with nectar, add two more. Continue to add supers to the parent colony throughout the summer as needed. Okay, um, with that, I, well, most bee, uh, beekeepers will just use the two high bodies and they will, will put the, the, uh, a super or two on. Sometimes they use a queen excluder and uh, it just depends on, usually what I do is I, I put on the queen excluder, I'll leave it on for a week or two, but a queen will not cross half honey, and a lot of times queen excluders will kind of inhibit how much honey you get, but there's kind of a, a queens are kind of funny, they won't cross over half honey. So if if you have that queen excluder on, they cap, they cap around it when it's full, you can put your supers as many as you want on. You can put supers on no matter how, but just keep them um, I mean, I like to extract them as soon as the super is capped because I get a different flavor honey. Later on, midsummer, late late summer, fall, they're producing a different flavor of honey. So, and I'm honey honey hungry. I got farmers market. I got to make some money on. So I extract it as soon as it does. I put that super back on again. It saves you buying super. Some people. I've seen some, if you got, if you want to have a lot of supers, you can stack them on, you know, and you can wait till fall to get everything extracted at one time. And um, so, uh, but if you, you got to buy a lot of supers to do that. If you got a lot of bees, that's a lot of supers. So that's, I'm, I'm kind of a tight one. I don't like to buy a whole heck of a lot of supers. I might as well keep using them over and over as the season go. Extract, put them on, extract, put them on. So that's what I do. Okay, any questions? Okay. In late summer, you will have honey to harvest. Remember, three colonies to be wintered with about 75 to 100 pounds of honey. The honey you will harvest will come from the honey supers, not from the hive bodies containing brood. Remove all the bees from the supers using one of several methods. Keep the supers covered as you work. With a sharp motion, shake the bees in front of the hive entrance, or brush the bees off the frames in front of the hive entrance using a bee brush. Bee go, or honey robber, can be applied to a fume board on top of the super. The vapors will drive the bees out. 
This works best on warmer days. The super should be aired out before extracting. A bee blower will force the bees from the supers. Use a high volume, low pressure blower. A leaf blower or heavy duty shop vacuum set to blow will work for this. You need at least one of the following. Capping scratcher, uncapping knife. Okay. Um, to, uh, to clean the bees off, I prefer to use uh, the brush method. I take an empty box and I transfer. I, what I do is I go from, I mean, I have the super that's with the frames in next to the, uh, the hide body and I will brush the bees off and put it in an empty box back and forth. If the bees are really, they call it, don't want to stay away from that, I can use a towel or something like that to just remove it, just to keep the, bee, the bees off. So, but it's very time consuming to do it. If you're in a big hurry, uh, you can use blower equipment, you're really pissing the bees off and you blow them out. And uh, they don't like, I like that too well, but it's a lot faster. Uh, the chemical ways, they said, Honey robber. I've only used that once. That stuff is nasty. Uh, you put it on the fume board and the wind's right and you take a whiff of that. It smells like somebody vomited on a hot wood stove. It stinks. <laughs> you don't want to go inside. So that, I really discouraged that. It's got the curic acid in it. They make another one called Bee Quick that is an almond extract one. Some beekeepers have used that. But what you do there is you Put it on a fume board, set it on top of the hive. It should be a fairly sunny day, so those fumes will go down. They repel the bees down. You can take the whole super off. There might be a few bees in there, but that doesn't matter. So uh, that's another way of doing it. There's an, uh, another way of using a bee escape, and that's where you use your inner cover. You have a little contraction there. You put it on the day before. So therefore, you gotta lift the supers off, lift them back on, put that the skateboard on. What the bees do is they go back down to visit the queen or to get out of there, and they can't get back. That is one way that the next day you come and take the super off, but it's more labor intensive that way. So uh, that's the way to do it. So okay, let's watch the study extraction. So you bring your supers in. You want to get the honey out of them, and this will show you different ways to do that. Uncapping plain or automatic uncapper. If you're a pro, you've got to also need an uncapping tray to catch the wax cappings. An extractor, either power or hand crank, will be needed to extract the honey. This is a centrifugal device that spins out the honey. A strainer is used to strain the honey as it comes from the extractor. This can be a coarse screen to get the large pieces of wax, a nylon cloth to strain all of the wax, or a double screen. A container will be needed to store the honey until it is bottled. Depending on your honey harvest, this may be quart jars, gallon jugs, five gallon pails, 55 gallon barrels, or a tanker. <laughs> Extract the honey the same day it is removed from the hive whenever possible. Any honey held for extraction should be kept in a warm, dry room. Remove the cappings from the combs. That's what if the knife does plain. not remove all of the cappings, use the capping scratcher to remove them. Place the uncapped frames into the extractor. In a tangential extractor, turn the basket slowly at first, then pick up speed as the frames empty. Partially extract one side of the frames, turn them around, and extract the other side. Turn them around once more, and finish the first side. <laughs> the frames will have to be spun from 5 to 20 minutes per side. If you spin full combs too fast, you may damage the combs. An electric radial extractor will pick up speed slowly. 
The frames do not need to be rotated in this type of extractor. Open the honey gate and strain the honey into a settling tank or bucket with the gate. Let the honey settle to allow any wax to migrate to the top of the tank. Bottle the warm, strained honey in clean, attractive jars or plastic containers. Let the honey run down the inside of the bottle to prevent bubbles from forming. I do things a little differently. Um, first of all, my background is I am a dumpster diver. I'm a tight one. I hate to spend money on stuff I find. Um, I, okay, I'm going to tell you one, one career I had that changed my life. I used, I used to work in Hillsborough at the former farm in the lab. And I developed a system there of, they didn't cost me any money. All I had to do was go to the dumpster and I got what I needed. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, I have... Is a capping structure. I don't like to use knives or planes or anything like that because you end up with sticky, messy cappings that you got to drain, and nothing worse is stickier than honey. So, and the cappings is kind of like either if you got an electric knife on there, you're scorching the honey. If you don't have the temperature set right, your arm gets really sore by moving this knife back and forth all the time. So, and I discovered the easiest thing is this roller here. Uh, you, you, can buy, you can buy these out of, out of uh, uh, supply houses. Eli Click, I think, has them too. So in other words, I just take that, oops, where was that one? Uh, oh, the weapon. Okay. Yeah, that one there. Yeah, I did say. Okay, so I just have a towel. I roll this around. This punctures the cell. So I don't want to do now about that honey all over the place. <laughs> so you just roll. If there's a spot you can't get, I have a scratcher, I will do that. Okay, that shatters the cap. It's a lot neater, a lot faster, and when I put it in my extractor, I have an old 24 frame extractor. If you want to break your arm for a couple of days, you just keep cranking and cranking and cranking. I, they, it's a lot of work, but an extractor will cost you, I think, anywhere from between $300 to $500 for a hand crank. Uh, usually, electric ones start about $700. So you can get one for 3000 depending on the size. I got a big one for 24 frame. I can extract honey fairly fast. So what I do is I just roll it, set it in the extractor. When the extractor is full, start out really slow and let her, and, the, and as, as it empties, I can adjust the speed on it, on my extractor. Towards the end there, that thing is really wet. I mean, it's like going really fast. And uh, the honey, for the most part, is all out of it. But you're always going to leave one uh, one percent of the honey because that, you know it just won't it won't come out. But all the honey settles down. And uh, so anyway, I do. So yeah, I got the honey. And what I do again is one day instead of using five gallon buckets. I have a couple hundred of these. So these are cheese color jugs. What? Cheese color. Cheese color came in these. Perfect food grade. Wash them out, sanitize them. But what is really neat about them is how you can adapt it to honey. I fill up honey with this. And what I do is I put it right in, in uh, right underneath this part of my extractor. Kind of keep an eye on it. I've never overfilled one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you to overfill them. Uh, but anyway, and, and then I put this cap on, and it, all of my, what do you call it, unfiltered honey is in here. So, another thing, 
I, I, I want to take, uh, take that home. And so I, uh, what I say about this, this here is, there's a little, man, I can't get out of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a three-eighths, a three-quarter inch pipe threaded hole. I put that on there. And here I got one all set up. I put this on there. Okay. Another thing I dumped to die for. <laughs> and I'll pass this around. I've got a few hundred of these. Uh, these are bulk socks. In the dairy industry, when they fill the filling up a cheese vat, they, uh, this is a finer filter. After every vat of cheese, uh, they got to got discard them. This is the best thing to strain honey through ever. And uh, so, what I do is I cut in half. Why don't you just pass that around? Just so what it's like. So anyway, I, I cut in half because it's only at that long. I, I screw this. Okay, uh, this here is a plastic output wire dagger center, and I double it up and I use a cable tie so it's all set to to uh, come out. So I put this on this full of honey, set it down like this here. Have another clean sanitized jug down there, tip it up a little bit, and it runs from one jug to the other, transferring it to a nice clean jug. And then I can uh, set it and forget it. You know, whenever I need honey, I've got a five gallon jug. Now, when, when, I, when uh, I get an order of honey or I want to bottle it, I take this out. I take it out and I have this valve in here. And this is what I set down and I fill up my, my jars of honey. There's uh, anywhere from four pound jars to eight ounce jars. And there's a little a breather hole here that you can use too. So if you need any of these, I got them. I won't charge any for them. Or you can return them, I'll lend them to you. So anyway, therefore I can uh, uh, fill up my jars using this here. Now let's say last fall I got this full of honey. All of a sudden uh, I go to do this and it's harder than a brick. Crystallized honey. Everybody's seen crystallized honey. You can't do nothing with it. You set warm it up. Well, one thing is you got to be careful warming it up. You want raw honey, you want liquidy, you don't want to scorch it. So what I do is I have a, uh, well there's two ways of doing it. Either I have a barrel, a plastic barrel I cut in half, and it's submerged in hot water with a little heater in it. And I have a uh, thermometer like this. This is a silo thermometer. Again, I, did, I, I went in and dumped the dyes and picked these up. Uh, state regulations say you got to change them after two, uh, two uh, years. I think they're found on milk silos. Any dairy plant you go over, see these nice stainless steel, big, big silos. This is a temperature gauge for it because it comes to the temperature. Works great for honey. So all I do, let's say, is I got this thing harder than a rock. I just push this into that hole there. When it gets up to 110 to 110 to degrees or a little over or, and still raw, then all the honey's liquid heat. It's easy to fill up, so I can fill can fill my jars up whenever I want. So, so that okay, this is one method of doing it. It works for me. I like it a lot and it works great. So uh, and these jugs are great because you don't have to have a great big, I mean, a, a five-gallon bucket with these snap-on lids that are hard to get off. These uh, these jugs for me are going to catch me on. So, okay. And if, uh, and then I just rent rent them out. Keep your using them here or here. Yes. How much would a jug like that weigh? Oh, oof, this is heavy, man. I'm just like, <laughs> Uh, 65 to 70 pounds. I'm talking high heavy. 
a gallon of honey weighs 12 pounds. Usually on these I can get 65 to 70 pounds in here. And it's heavy. And so a lot of times where I like to do this honey straining and the filtering is in my basement. I, it's a lot of work carrying it downstairs and then carrying, carrying it up. I store all my honey in my basement in these five, uh, five gallon jugs as I need it. I can do it. Another thing too is I can label it. Oh, this, uh, this was my first extraction from this yard. I know it's going to be a light honey. In the fall, I get a darker honey, so I can kind of pick my flavor I want to do it. If you did want buckets, um, I've gone up to the big shop around 14, and then I'll, mm -hmm. if, if you're a customer, I'll give you a bucket yep. so you can make a donation. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure, sure. I like small ones. You're right, right. There's no, uh, nothing wrong with buckets, uh, any size you want. But, uh, uh, and, uh, but you want to keep your honey clean. You want it tight. You don't want it. Uh, what you call it, uh, open to, uh, to the air. When you open it to the air, moisture gets in it, and uh, it, it can start fermenting once it's a certain amount of moisture. So I, uh, when I bought my business, I got a, this little water jacketed bag, and I could put about 20, 30 gallons of honey in there. Well, any time any I wanted to do it, I had to keep heating it up. But let's say I only wanted three or four gallons of honey, you know, because that's all I had demand for. And I sooner have the honey crystallized in here than inside the jar. If you put in warm water and you got labeled, it is kind of a pain in the butt to, to get it recrystallized. Re if you've got a method, and some people use a an, another method is to make a hot box. And what works great is a, a uh, refrigerator or a freezer doesn't work anymore. Stick a light bulb in there. In a couple of days, depending on the size of the light bulb and how, what temperature is, that will relipify your honey. Another thing that relipifies, I mean, when I sell to uh, Quillens or uh, the food co op, my honey will crystallize. People are so, they call it gun shy of crystallized, crystallized honey. They don't want to take it. They think it's spoiled. Something's wrong with it. There's a total absolutely falsehood about that. So uh, these two stores have honey they ain't going to sell them unless I liquefy it. Well, I discovered by accident about three or four years ago, we bought ourselves a new oven, a new stove. It has uh, a dehydrate cycle in it. So what I do is I take them, I put it in the oven, and I can set the temperature anywhere between 100 degrees and uh, 110, or I don't always set it at 100 to 105 degrees. I leave it in there and uh, uh, for a couple hours, and the honey would be liquefied. Nothing wrong with it, back on the shelf it goes. <laughs> so uh, that's one, another way of doing it, so. Yes? Okay. The, like, the, the shelves of supermarkets pasteurized. I, I often wonder if it's why. Okay. <laughs> pasteurizing. <laughs> you know, they don't pasteurize it for bacteria. They pasteurize it. In other words, they heat it up to 160 degrees. Uh, and you, usually that's what you find in commercial honey on a store shelf. It's been heated to 160 degrees. All of the uh, honey crystals are dissolved, but here's what happens when you do that. You get up to 160 degrees. All your enzymes, all your goodies, all the flavor, all you got is a sugared, a sugared uh, syrupy product right, right there. You've destroyed all the vitamins. Any, any goodies about the raw, uh, of honey that you buy on the shelf is, is gone. So. A lot of times you want to, I mean, most of the time during the whole year, I can, uh, uh, without even to heat it up before it crystallizes, I will uh, uh, just extract a certain bottle. That's simple. Do you sell uh, your honey in 
greater volumes in vials, like at the co-op they have that big tank? Uh, yeah, there's another honey producer that does it, and I think he sells them five, at five gallons a time. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, there's another bigger honey producer down by Bloomingdale who, who uh, they, they have there, and he, he's got, I think, 200 or 300 hives, and so he can supply them with more, a more bulk honey. So it's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what he does with his uh, for keeping it from getting uh, a crystallized. I don't pass that as mine. I, I, and if, anytime you buy a jar of honey from any place, make sure it says raw on it. Uh, and some, Greg, at the co-op, I asked him once yeah. if it was raw in the fall. Yeah, it's yeah. Not it's not, okay. It used to be, and maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of times, I mean. Yeah. It, was, it was two years ago that I asked him, and I just yeah, said, I, I Yeah, I, I mean, he booted that, uh, actually, that's the name, name, but Kikapu Honey down by uh, Blue, uh, Blue River was part, was uh, doing them, and they would put honey in the shelf. With me, he gave me a call. I said, I want your business. I'm going to come and get your honey, and I'm going to liquefy it. And they're going to charge you not much, but and that way it it will move better. And with them, they didn't want to do it. So right. yeah, he said, "You're out of here, Jonah." Said, "Bye." You know. So he got this other guy down there. And, you know, I would. I mean, I use things on a smaller scale. I'm more fussy about it. I don't have the, all that automatic equipment that they have. You know, I mean, a lot of bee beekeepers will spend thousands of dollars on uh, on high tech uh, equipment and, and go from there. There's a guy up by Malvina you know, that I buy up by my uh, 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 my nukes from, and he's got a big honey operation. He doesn't even have to touch it. He doesn't use shallow coopers like that. He uses all all uh, Deeps and and deeps at supers and he's got forklifts and everything else. Uh, they take all the honey off, and he's got such an automatic thing that it takes all the frames out one at a time. It's quite an automated system to see it working. I mean, I've seen it, but I haven't seen it working. But anyway, it takes frame by frame, drops it down, slices off the the cappings. Uh, and then it automatically goes into this uh, uh, extractor, and from there he fills up uh, barrels at a time with honey. And that's the way he sells it. You know, it's all automated. It's all faster and all that too. So, and you don't know where the honey's coming from, how old it is, because he doesn't inspect frame a frame by frame. You know. And so all he wants to do is get the honey out of there and get his get his money for it. You know, he doesn't have time to mess around uh, at farmers market or stores or anything like that too. So, and I should say, I mean, I the uh, selling honey in stores. I mean, man, there are places all over I want to get to to sell honey. I haven't, I haven't, we call it, haven't had the time to do it because I'm doing my regular stuff. So, it's always easy time to expand a lot. Do you so. have to have some sort of inspection or certification? Uh, okay, yeah, so. okay, that's a good question. Uh, certification, not in the state yet. Um, the only time uh, you, uh, you can sell honey in stores if uh, uh, if you got a good label on it and it's raw and you haven't done anything for raw and keep it raw. If you flavor honey, if you add anything to it, uh, that's what you call processing honey. Then, uh, therefore, you have to have a a, a state and food inspector. You got to make sure your equipment is all stainless steel. You got a hand wash sink. You got a sprayable floor. You got water around and all this stuff. This is uh, just a food license and. Since honey is a raw product and you keep it raw, you don't add anything to it, you don't have any issue with that. And though some stores want this, other stores it doesn't matter. But uh, and there's such a thing as a pickle law too. What they do, the state has eased up on this a little bit, and honey can be good. I could maybe process my honey a little bit more 
Uh, another process is that I then take her around with what you call cream honey. Uh, cream honey is crystallized honey, but you add a, what should I say? If you, if you have honey that is crystallized naturally, it's got a sharp crystal to it. When you eat it, it's going to poke your mouth up a little bit. When you buy uh, cream honey, it's got a smaller crystal. There's a fine chemistry around how crystals preserve. If you introduce a small crystal, you're going to get uh, nice small crystals, and that's what you can sell for for uh, uh, as cream honey. But essentially, what they call cream honey, you take a gallon and you put it in a bowl. You add some uh, a cup of this seed, you might say, stir it up. Uh, and put it in little tubs and there's no faster way to crystallize honey as to refrigerate it. So all you have to do is just keep it cool, it's going to crystallize up fast and uh, a lot of people like it because you, you can spread it on toast like butter, you know, and, and, and it's really good. Some people don't mind it crystallized away. It's kind of funny, over in Europe, uh, that's the way they want it. They won't buy honey liquid, they want it crystallized. And uh, so that's the way they, they do it over there. Yes? Do you have to some like cinnamon and pumpkin? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah you, have to, you can add all kinds of flavors to that. But then there's... <coughs> and then there's uh, honey that if you want to really be fussy, you, uh, you can have different varieties of honey because of the floral source. Uh, there's a guy I was uh, uh, down by, uh, between Reestown and Boston, I was 14. This guy's going to be raising lavender. And lavender in France is really a good taste in honey. And I would like to have some, I'm going to approach him to see if I can get some hives down there at the right time to ver produce a lavender flavored honey. Usually around around here, our honey is good because it's everything. Anything that blooms, they're going to use up. So I can't really pinpoint it. People say, well, what kind of flavor it is? Well, it's <laughs> the aroma flavor, you know? <laughs> Look around, that's what you're getting, you know? So, but I mean, but uh, if you can get in a buckwheat field, that's a good, mm -hmm. a good part of honey. So, you know, you can do it whatever you want. So, okay. Well, I kind of showed you everything that I kind of do it. Uh, you know. So, I guess we can uh, go back. How much, and how much honey do you produce? Okay. Uh, it depends on the year. Some hives do real good. Sometimes, some don't. Uh, usually, I I'm really bad about about keeping numbers, but I would say. Uh, I've had anywhere between fifty and. 100 pounds of honey per hive. And a second hive, a, a good, strong second year hive will produce you a lot more than a first year honey. And this is, just depends on the weather, it depends on the number of flowers they got, you know, and the strength of the hive and the bees and what they're really willing to go out for. Uh, one guy I helped, uh, well, he's been keeping bees longer than I have, but he only wants one hive a year. And, uh, one year, uh, we had over 300 pounds of honey out of that one night. And that's, yeah, there's almost 360 pounds. Because he showed up three, t uh, three times that year with six scoopers of, of for me to extract. So he ended up with a lot of honey. So yeah, you, uh, you range from like 150 to 300 with all your hives? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, no, I would say I average fifty to hundred on average per hive, mostly. Right? So how many hives? I got between uh, twenty and thirty hives, okay. and that's all I intend to do. I'd like to get more, but sometimes my bees don't make it over the winter, and I always have a theory of I can borrow the money, but I might keep a, a <laughs> banker off my back because you're paying him and he doesn't work. I do so. <laughs> Okay, let's finish this up, I guess.
colonies that are strong enough to be wintered. With the management scheme we have outlined, you will only winter colonies in three deep high bodies with young queens. These colonies will include new package bees and divides. Remember, to winter your colonies effectively, your colony should have a young queen, no mites, or as few as possible, no diseases, adequate honey stores. Prepare your colonies for winter as you did the previous year. If your colony has a young queen, is disease and mite free, and has adequate honey stores, your bees will survive even the harshest winter. Bees cluster within the hive during the winter. They shiver their flight muscles to generate heat and feed on honey warmed within the cluster. This colony will be strong in the spring. It was the divide the previous spring. Next spring, it will become a honey producing colony. If a colony is wintered without adequate stores, or if it is not treated for mites, it may succumb in the middle of winter, as did this parent colony. It is best to take colony losses in late fall. A quick summary. Remember, our system depends on four basic principles. You should select good equipment and a good location. Your queens should be young and prolific. They'll need nectar and pollen stores at all times. And your hives should be disease and mite free. There are as many ways of keeping bees as there are beekeepers. The management system shown here is based on the natural life cycle of the colony in northern climates. Beginning and experienced beekeepers have had consistent success with this system over many years. Consult the manual for more details. Take time to observe and enjoy your bees. Treat them well and they will return the favor. Sometimes it will crystallize in the comb, and you can't get that honey out. The bee, the bees can get it out eventually. If you feed it to them. So another method of feeding, if you've got some hives that you haven't taken the honey off, just re replace the hive. And that way, you can always feed them honey too. Or another thing, I I do. I mean, either sugar <coughs> syrup or. Um, or old honey. I mean, I got honey. I call it my slop honey. Something over spills on the floor, or something isn't just right with the honey, or um, it gets dirty some way. I can always feed that back to the bees. At the end of my extractor, when I tip it up, there's always honey that constantly drips out of it. I collect that, and then I just put it in a jug and feed, feed my bees that food. No, the ice cream bucket. Mm -hmm. It's not a hole, huh? Big of a hole. Okay, no, 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 okay. Uh, that, that's another method to do it. Uh, you can buy buckets with these, uh, a little mesh hole. It's a, like, almost like uh, uh, that, that uh, screen, I, I mean, that filter sock I have. Mm -hmm. It's real fine. And, and uh, uh, the honey will, uh, will not come through it. The syrup will not come through it. But the bees can feed through it. You know, right? So it's a real fine mesh in, in those buckets. And you can buy that. And you, you can buy feeder buckets or any type of feeder too. I should talk about diseases a little bit. Um, uh, uh, there used to be one out there called American Fall Brood. It's a bacterial disease. Um, it's been very contagious. You used it, but if you got it, you you could buy. Uh, but nowadays, it's kind of hard to get. It's uh, um, and antibiotics on it. I don't use antibiotics unless I have a problem. I haven't had a problem for eight nine years. But uh, you, you could treat this American problem. It's a bacteria disease, highly contagious. Well travel from hive to hive because if a bee makes it there, it's got it. It's, and it kind of rots and kills the brood in your bees. And eventually, if it's left untreated, your whole hive is going to be uh, 
um, done for it. Your equipment is contaminated with this, and the only thing most of the time you can do is either uh, sanitize it by burning or scorching it with heat, uh, washing it with hot water and bleach will do it, but uh, that's just your box. It's the wax is completely contaminated and you're better off by burning it in your frames too. So uh, that's one of the things, the most, but it's kind of clearing up. Uh, it hasn't been that too many uh, people have had this problem. Uh, another, uh, as I say, the mites are always a problem. You want to try to inspect them. Uh, uh, I mean, there, I got sheets over there how to uh, use a sugar roll or alcohol wash. I got a special cup to check for mice by washing them off of the screen and you can see the mice floating around. Last year I didn't have much problem with mice and of, of, of all the people I helped, I only had one one guy of about 10 or 15 people I was helping that had mice. Every time I went in, it was a fast way to check for mice. So, and uh, usually I didn't see any mice, but I found a half a dozen with one wash that hit that we treated that right away. Our treatment is, there's a, if you look at the beef catalog, there's all kinds of treatment. I prefer uh, Formic Pro, it's a Formic Acid Strip. Uh, you, you can leave the supers on and it, uh, uh, it's, uh, you put it on and you want to wait at least, I can't remember what the directions say, at least a week or two before you take them off. Uh, it kind of fumigates the, the hive. Another method is oxalic acid. I, I didn't bring that along, but you kind of buy oxalic acid, which is a in the same chemical line as formic acid is, uh, but you gotta have a little battery burner, or it's like a little thing with a little cup on it, it's hot, produces fumes of oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is found in wood bleach, the agri center has it. Uh, you use a tablespoon of that, and, it, and that will get rid of the mites, uh, or at least curtail. So you always wanna keep your mite load down, it depends on the year of what, how how uh, how your mice will be come, come back to life last year with no problem. The year before I had a lot of problems with mites and I treated up from that to well also too I had trouble with yellow jackets. Yellow jackets wiped out over twenty of my hives back uh, of the year the year before last by the first of October. Uh, a lot of beekeepers had problems around this area with yellow jackets. Other beekeepers out uh, of the state didn't have any problem with it. But, yeah. With yellow jackets, how do they wipe out hives? They go in there, uh, they want to hunt. The huh? Repeat the question. Oh, she wants to know how yellow jackets can kill, can get in the hive. Uh, well, when they did, there was a negative problem. They didn't have nothing to eat. It would get rain for six weeks, the weather is hot, and they, and for some reason they were, it must have been the perfect storm to breed yellow jacket because they were all over the place. And uh, one way I could tell is even putting out, uh, let's say I get done in uh, extracting, uh, actually I should tell you, for extracting you should have a tight area that you can extract on. So, Though insects or bees can get in because bees can smell it. I use an old bus. <laughs> I got an old commuter bus. I got the seats on that. I can I kind of keep the, the honeybee from coming or yellow jackets. But that year, I would set out a, uh, what's called a wet soup or something. I just got done extracting. It's still sticky, still got a little honey on it. And oh my gosh, within five, five minutes, it was covered with honeybees and with yellow jackets and you name it, it was just terrible. And I know in one yard I was, I was taken off the honey and uh, there were three times more yellow jackets than honeybees, but I, I just had the supers on there and it was just loaded with bees just feeding like crazy. I drove down the road, looked out my rear, I looked back my truck was on fire, the bees were going on. <laughs> That's what it was like. So hopefully we won't have that anymore. But a yellow jacket trap or something like that will do it to kind of help 
two beekeepers tried that. It got yellow jackets, but overall, there was enough guard bees to keep the yellow jackets out. Because the yellow jackets overwhelmed the bees, uh, especially when the bees were out looking for uh, nectar sources, and they took over, they killed the bees, they went in and robbed, uh, robbed the honey. I tried to catch the honey. I extracted everything. If the hive is dead, the honey's there, extract it. You know, so. Okay, yes? Is there something that can keep the yellow jackets population in check so that doesn't happen? Like something naturally, like a, uh, another insect or a bird? Not that I'm aware of, no. no. Yellow jackets are yellow jackets. They're going to be in their <coughs> yellow jackets. They're the ones that will crawl on the, out of the ground. It's kind of a, they call it a, a whole thing of any bee that isn't a hornet, <laughs> you know. And hornets will do, will do the same thing, too. You know, but yellow jackets can live in a, in a uh, uh, in the ground that they can make their big nice nest up in a tree that's usually gray color, football shape, or they can get into walls and they can build nests into walls or anything like that. And I've gone out helping people get rid of the, rid, of, rid of their yellow jackets because I've been I got the protection I need and uh, usually I will kill them by. Uh, spraying bleach around them. Once in a while, I use horn wasp killer. Sometimes that doesn't really isn't too strong. And then another thing I use is uh, foggers. If I got a big cavity place, I, I put foggers in there. So that's another way to do it. So um, so anyway, um. So that's, I think that's a problem. That um, when they use the isopropyl alcohol yeah. and the foggy method you talked about to control mites, yeah. do those adversely affect the bees at all? Oh, no, okay. Here, I, I, well, you see, uh, I need something. <coughs> okay. Um, you're going to kill, uh, kill, kill the bees. Uh, I mean, only a handful of bees. Okay, I bought this thing because it's fast, it's easy. Okay, so this has got a basket, it's got a container that doesn't, doesn't quite go down. I put an alcohol solution on the, the directions call for one part alcohol to four parts of water. So I just put, put that in there with this little basket I have here. The bees are kind of, I put a couple handfuls in there just so it's maybe about half full of bees. So what I do is I put this on, shake, 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 shake for a minute. All the, all of the um, mites are washed off of the bees. But the bees are dead. Sorry, you can't keep, you can't wash a bee and keep it alive. <laughs> you know, so anyway, uh, this is one way of doing it. Then I can take this out pull the bees, dump the bees out their death, and then I can see the mites floating around in here. So this is really more a way of testing to see if you have mites rather than exterminating the mites, because in order to do that, then you'd be well, uh, the bees. Well, you can. I think I've got it here. There's another method of doing this. Uh, uh, this is another method of doing it using powdered sugar. Yeah, you, you can, I don't know if, you, if I pass it out last week or not. You can take one if you want, make sure you get one back there. Uh, that tells you how to <coughs> use powdered sugar. Okay, essentially use using powdered sugar. Mm -hmm. And you take a one pint jelly jar with the, uh, the uh, with the, the band lid, you know, you, put, you know, screw down. And you need like a quarter inch screen. If you need screen, I got all kinds of screen screen. for screen. But anyway, so go out and buy a screen. But it's one little, uh, a, a quarter inch screen. There's instructions on the back too. And uh, on the back of that sheet. So anyway, uh, so what I do is, this is called a powdered sugar roll. So in other words, you take a handful of beef, put it in the jar, 
put in a, a tablespoon or two of powdered sugar and you use it in your roll and everything else. The, the, the powdered sugar causes the mite to lose its grip on the beef. So in other words, and so anyway, when you, uh, I mean, you put your hand on it, on the screen so it doesn't knock out powdered sugar, but you shake it for a while, and then you shake the powdered sugar onto a clean pan of water. It dissolves the sugar and you see these little red dots floating around if you've got mice. Just, uh, I just uh, dumped the bees out. They're going to be a little cantankerous because you just sugar, powdered sugar from them and they didn't like it. You know? But uh, that, uh, that way you're not killing any bees. It doesn't hurt for a few bees. You know, you're not there. Usually in a hive there's 60,000 bees in a strong hive, so. How do you evaluate them? Whether you got just a few lines? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think they're kind of changing. They always say, well, your hive can always tolerate a few mites. Well, usually if you see one mite, you probably got a thousand in your hive. So, you know, it's like, no mice is good, you know. You know, it's just like being being an alcoholic. You know, I mean, if you're ah, eh, one beer ain't gonna hurt, but you know, they're still gonna arrest you whether you had three beers or twenty-three beers. You know, it's, you're you're over the limit. You know, so you so know. If you got a few of that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got mice regardless, yeah. and they always say, huh? And then you treat. Yeah, you want to treat for mice because they ain't gonna go away. They're just gonna make worse. Well, maybe I should just forget that test and just buy your strips and trigger them. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people do. Yeah, they street, they, they just say, heck with it. You know, it's just like getting vaccinated, you know. If, uh, you know, if you're, you want to prevent it, so you just keep, well, keep it. Right. And, uh, you know, let's say, don't use the medicine, you don't need to. Right, right, you know, right. And, right. and sometimes they, they, a lot of people say, well, <coughs> we call it, Try different treatments because the mice might be resistant or build up resistance from one or the other. I think I read that using formic acid, you're killing all the mites, so really, and that's an organic approved way of doing it too. Uh, your acids now are, you know, oxalic acid. Actually, there's a little gadget in, in the beef uh, books that uses vinegar, which is in the same family as uh, formic acid, acetic acid, or acetic acid is what vinegar has in it. They, they fume this and that gets rid of the mice too. This is a lot more expensive procedure. But, uh, but most people, or even the, prevent, the professional beekeeper, he doesn't have time to go from hive to hive. And you've got a thousand hives, you don't have time to just hire somebody, pay, pay them to just to stick the mite strips in two or three times during the summer, and most of the time the mites are, in, are gone anyway, so whether you need it or not. Yes? Well, the best thing to do is tackle the root cause of what causes the mites in the first place, and that's the pesticides or recycling. Oh, no, well, no, I don't know. The, uh, the, the, the pesticides and herb, uh, all the chemicals are not a result of them. I didn't come because of the pesticide. It, it came in from South Africa to South America. It hit, it hit in the late 80s, the mites did. And it travels all over. I mean, if you've got, a lot of times it's like, what do you call it? If you're clear in Timbuktu, you might not get a mite at all. But if you're living around here and somebody three or four miles down the road is a professional beekeeper, they can pick up mice from one bee and mice sneak into your hive. So it's, and it just depends on, most of the time the mites live under drone brood. They, they develop under drone brood because of the gestation of the drones. So the, I think it's like 20, or 25 days for a drone that's in brood, which is just just uh, right for that uh, mite to, to gestate to it. 
I mean, there's all different kinds of non-technical ways of doing it. Um, you know, other than that, uh, screen bottom boards. In other words, it's not a solid board. It's got screening. It might, if if might comes on a V and it loses its grip, it's going to fall straight down through the screen and die on the ground. So that might, so that's one one way 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 of, of reducing them. Another way to reduce them, and you can get this too, is um, in uh, buying a drone, a drone foundation. Drone foundation is a bigger size cell. So you can buy uh, a foundation that the bees will do, that the bee, the bees will draw out, the queen will lay, and it's a mystery why she does it, she will lay an unfertilized egg in these drone cells. So you've got a whole thing of drone cells, just plastered with drone cells across. And all you have to do is to take this, and once it's all dried out, and you want to go watch this at a certain time, you don't want to neglect it for three or four weeks, but as soon as that, that frame of drone brew is out, you take it home with you and you dump it in the freezer for overnight. It's going to kill all of the brood, and then you can scrape it off, put it back in there, and more drone is going to be produced too. Another, another method, and, and this is non-chemical, is when you is uh, using a different size of frame. Let's say this frame here is all drawn out, but if you were to stick this size of frame, and one frame ain't going to matter a whole heck of a lot. I mean, forget about the honey in there. What happens is the queen is going to uh, fill this up with regular brood. Down here, they make wax because there's a space to make wax. They will draw, and I've seen this, uh, people will just uh, for, get their frames mixed up, aren't paying attention, and the bees will make a nice, a nice, um, which is a uh, wax that will extend down below this. It's all grown. All the, all they have to do is to take this out, scrape it off, throw it, throw it in the bucket if they want the wax, stick it back in again. And lo and behold, it's going to be more drone. If there's mites, they're going to, uh, they like to go in, into the drone. And this is just the same cycle over and over and over again. So that works too. So, so. okay, what anything else? What about propolis? Huh? Propolis. Oh, propolis. Okay, propolis. It's got to, you're, you're going to get propolis. And uh, let's see. Find some on one of those sprays there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a little propolis on here. Propolis is this crap here. I should say crap. <laughs> it's a lot of people like it. It's the bee, the bee glue. It's like hard resin that they, they line it with. They will glue your frames together and stick. It's just a sticky mess. You have to scrape your frames of it. Yeah, you kind of keep ahead of it. And if you want, <laughs> and, if, huh? <laughs> yeah. and if you want, you, you can uh, uh, collect it and you can melt it down. It's got a good medicinal purpose to it. There's a company that will buy propolis for you. You're constantly scraping it off, moving it around a lot. So um, the, another gadget you can buy is what we call a propolis trap. Um, in other words, bees use propolis when they want to see a lot of light. They don't like light, they want dark in there. So if there's a little, a little crack or so in your hive, a little air getting in, they're going to fill up, fill up the propolis. Now a propolis trap is used, instead of using your inner cover, you lay the screen and it's a kind of a uh, heavy duty plastic, almost like a plastic, uh, a plastic 
queen excluder except he has got little slots that are all over. It's just all rolled up with slots. And they're probably like an eighth inch thick or so. You set that on top of there, you put your inner cover on top of that, but you prop you prop your inner cover up a little bit. DC that, they hate the light, they're going to propolize the whole sheet with propolis. Well, when the sheet's full, all you have to do is to, to, add, to take it home, put it in, in your freezer, put it in a garbage bag, and then after a few hours, if it's cold, it's brittle. And you can knock all of this propolis, so you'll have a powdered propolis there that you have not loose from the screen and you can put it back on there. I've never messed around with it, but you can if you want. You know, and people will buy it. There's, there's recipes to make all kinds of pinchers and mouthwashes and everything else using propolis. And it's a good, um, it's a good uh, a disinfectant, uh, uh, you know, too. I mean, that's the reason Bees will like go into a uh, hollow tree and they will kind of paint propolis on there so they have a sterile environment. They don't want some smelly old rotted wood smell. They will preserve it like that too. So a lot of it, it, it goes from year year to year, some and hive to hive. Some some uh, hives hardly have any propolis, but others are constantly scraping off. And a lot of times when you've got nine frames and you get this like quarter inch gap in there going from that, they will propolize that shut. So you gotta take your I mean that's what I always do, and most beekeepers will do it. And if you can't get a frame a frame to fit right, they'll stand there and scrape off all of this propolis. So I've never really taken time to collect it. It's a messy and when it's hot, it gets on your fingers. If you get it on your clothes, you can't get it off. The only thing that will dissolve propolis is alcohol, harsh alcohol. And the, one of the best alcohols to use is not rubbing alcohol. I go to a liquor store and buy absolute alcohol. That's just what people like to drink. But that works good for dissolving propolis. Yes. How do you collect the pollen? Okay. Um, now that's another tough topic too. <clears throat> I haven't taken time to do it, and it takes a little equipment. It takes a lot of time. You have to go out there one, once every three or four days. You can make or you can buy pollen traps. So in other words, a pollen trap is a little gadget with a little drawer in that you set where where the bees come in. Okay, and what? And the principle of it is it's tight enough that the bee has to squeeze through. A bee has a has a pollen packets on its legs. And you'll see bees bringing in pollen. It's nice yellow or uh, orangish, reddish color pot packed on their pollen sacks on their, on their legs. But they have to squeeze through this pollen trap in order to put their honey up or take their pollen through. Well, uh, they, they scrape through it, but they lose their pollen. It falls down into a little drawer, and, and, and with three or four days, you want to take that out. The pollen needs to be refrigerated right away, or dried right away, because it, it, it's kind of fragile, it will spoil. And but but then you can clean it. You can I I've never kept pollen before, but <coughs> uh, you can like fan it or you kind of pick out pieces of debris or bee parts out of it too. And you can put it in uh, and and refrigerate it or freeze it either way. And you can buy bee pollen, I think the food co-op had it. It's, it's pricey. They say it's a good health benefit for you, and uh, that, that's another thing about uh, honey around here. You buy local honey; it always honey has a little pollen in it already. It uh, is better for your allergies, and I have a lot of customers who sort of up and down, and my honey helps them with their allergies, which I will go for. It. 
from. <laughs> oh, you can't think of anything else. Oh, yes, there it is. Um, okay, uh, there's two things that I like to use for me. One is called Honey Be Healthy. This is an empty thing. I like this a lot. I sprayed new foundation with this. Okay, I just smell the end of it. You want to spray it? It's, it's very, it, it's got a lemongrass spearmint oil to it. Thieves love it. A spray like that, uh, you, you can't call, uh, calm the bees down because instead of using smoke, you, you can do that. And then I spray new foundation with that because the bees like it. They will draw the foundation out faster. Uh, the, uh, and if you feed it to the bees, you, uh, you can make up sugar solution. You feed it to the bees, they're going to take up the sugar syrup a lot faster. They're going to like it, and they'll probably do better using it. So that's one way to run it. So if you had a new box like that, you spray a new foundation with that? I, I like to. Brand new foundation. I will, and especially plastic foundation. Plastic, I really, every time I go through, I spray both sides. Every yes, time. yes, I do. I spray it, spray it all. That stuff is really, I, I like it. I mean, every, you know, and it's a little price. I think that thing like that is maybe close to $20. So, yeah. Do you dilute it at all? Yeah, oh, yeah. You, uh, you dilute it. I think uh, per quart is uh, maybe a quarter cup per quart or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, and it's a real, it comes in a concentrate. I, uh, I used to buy it at the Agri Center. Yeah, I love that. That, that thing's empty. Yeah, but, uh, it's empty. It's empty. It's empty. It's empty. Yeah, yeah, I might have been. I might have mentioned it all too, I don't remember. So, I like Honeybee Health because it helps throw out foundation. I use it on, on, uh, on brood foundation, brand new brood foundation. I use it as a super foundation. And use it on a cut of the foundation. So I like, and the bees like it, so that's another another thing. Another thing over the years, and uh, if you can get this from a bee, a bee from liar, is uh, just, I mean, I got a couple of copies, maybe just a look at it, a look at it over. Okay. Another thing that is really helping, and I'll pass that on to you guys too. Probiotics. Uh, probiotics, there's companies out in Milwaukee that makes a, pro, a probiotic for, for bees. Uh, uh, you can take like a tablespoon of it, sprinkle on the bees. It, it doesn't hurt the bees, it's all natural. Uh, but they have uh, found that probiotics makes a stronger bee. Uh, uh, it's going to be uh, a lot more stronger and resistant to any diseases. It will accept mites better. It will fight off viruses that the mites produce. Uh, the healthier bee will overwinter better. And uh, when I go to uh, uh, my conventions and everything, I, there are a lot of pollinators who are, yeah, pollinators and commercial beekeepers who like this. It has helped a lot. This colony collapsed, so it's just a super food. It's organically approved, uh, and uh, and uh, I say per hive, it probably I think how many? It's about a buck per hive, isn't it, Dale? Well, well, that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah, it's really reasonable, and I think it really has helped. I know with Dale there once I I. Uh, a couple of years ago, you had two hives that were overwintered for you. All of mine died in years to live because I put that on. What did that have to do with it? It helps. It helps. Oh, well, you, use uh, you can use it as much as you want to. They suggest probably two, three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, put it on in the spring, midsummer, late summer, and over winter. So. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt you. can't overdose it, you, you know, too. So. What's the name of that first uh, bottle of summer? Oh, uh, honey, honey be healthy. 
Okay. No. Just, just, no. Oh, that's just for next year? Yeah, no. Uh, that's <laughs> not. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's already mixed stuff. Uh, that's got honey to be healthy in it. Okay, you just you look at the honey. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. So yeah. The other empty jug is. Yeah, that's what, yeah, you right. You just it with water and put it in the yeah, bottle. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. You know, I just want them to feel, uh, feel the smell of it. Yeah. What strains of, like, probiotics do they use um, for the bees specifically? Do you what strains? Uh, yeah, okay, usually you buy a different size packages of it, and it says per hive. How it is. Usually it's a tablespoon per high you can sprinkle on. I like to mix it with some powdered sugar. It goes far. It spreads easier. The bees are going to laugh it up better. Being, being uh, I mean, I'm kind of spiking the, the powdered sugar with, uh, with that pro, uh, probiotic, you know. And I think they, and, and, and that helps them along faster. So, anyway, yeah. And all your bee suppliers are handling that now. I mean, uh, you know, and I'm using it more and more now. I think it's really helping the bees survive. And believe me, they need it, especially with the pesticides. The stronger the, the, stronger the bee, the more pesticide resistant they're going to be. So that's in my book. So uh, did everybody sign the sheet who came here? I think we did. Okay, yeah, just sign it right there. I'll put your name over oh, here. I, yeah, just put your name and address and telephone number on it. Did you hand out a uh, word by the bees? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to pass the sheet out. Um, I, I got a sheet here with bees for sale. I wish you would. Uh, it, you know, if you want, you can go to any supplier you want. I just want to uh, give it to you. Uh, there's two or three Amish people on there. I guess you got to go drive, drive, you know. Uh, there's a guy from Sparta, Myron Leaf, from, uh, there's Matt Schultz from Reesburg, and then uh, Willie DeWitt from uh, Melvina. Uh, I always have lately gotten my bees from Willie DeWitt. I buy nukes. Uh, some just have nukes, but some have packages and nukes. It just depends on which, which way you, you proceed on it. Um, I talked to Willie. He said probably right around the, after April 20th to first part of May, his nukes will be available. Um, I always like to get nukes in the sooner the better. Uh, and packages too, I always think the, the faster they hit the ground, the more. And then it's only 50 miles on the other side, it's like a supermarket with bee supplies there. And you can get woodware and you name it. So, anybody need one? Okay. I like that place a lot. Also, too, uh, yes, uh, last week we had. Uh, Eli Glick here. I do have if anybody is interested in the Amish guy five miles outside of Double Land, he's got very When is this thing on the back there? What's that? Is uh, he's got something going on? What, when oh yeah, and this is next week. Next week. Yeah, uh, next week he's having a little uh, he uh, talk at his he's place. Uh, it's an army shed about five miles out there. So if anybody needs uh, prices, yeah, okay. This army guy is. Oops, I got on my Okay. Yeah. And so anyway, um, anybody needs my card, I'm, uh, I'm available all the time. All the time. <laughs> Most of the time I welcome calls. Anybody needs my card? Do you, uh, or does anybody provide the service of extraction? Me. So you, yeah, you I do it. If you've got, if you've got somebody close to buy, well, then it's so if, you, if you've got some ready, you can bring it to you. Uh, what's that? If I had some ready, I could. Yeah, 
Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I would like to have it warmed up a little bit right. more warmer weather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I was there. Okay. If you want, you can come out with me and do it. It's only a couple miles out there, but I got this old yeah. dinosaur extractor works great. You know, so I extract quite a bit. I don't need any more money, so I can be behind it sooner than I can. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Anything right offhand? I thank you for coming. If you want, it's really interesting. It's, a little, it's like kind of getting married, you know, your little gotcha hand. You know, go, what you doing? But I, I'm always, you know, if you have any questions, God, yeah, just call me. I have had more more people who call me who have and I could have prevented them if they would have asked me. I know, I know one year I had this. Guy, a guy who called me from Chicago. And kind of arrogant, you know, man. He has the ability to back there. I said, hey, you got me before. No. Nope. I've read this book and the internet, I know everything there is to know about it. Nothing I don't know. Okay. Well, you want to, and he said, I like, I got some honey ready. Uh, let's uh, extract it. So we went down there and I started, I, I used my roller, put it in. All of a sudden, uh, everything fell apart. And as the roller starts up, his problem was he went to a piece of wire. Now, why the heck he did it? But he just had foundation that was just pure wax. No wires, no nothing. Deep frame, straight wax. Nothing and it, it, nothing to hold it in, and it was like, oh my God, every frame was. <laughs> He was spending all of his honey pool. Well, I had to clean five uh, five gallon buckets. I said, "Man, you did you did do things right." <laughs> and and so we scooped it all up, and he took it home, and he crushed it, and you know. And I said, "This is how you gotta do it," you know, you know. And I and I was kind of mad at the supplier who sold him that. And, you know, he's extracting. You don't sell pure beeswax. You want the wires in it, you know. Uh, you know, like like uh, this here. You want wires in it, and uh, and in order for this to be really be good, you got to cross wire it too, you know. So, but anyway, I kind of shot him down. <laughs> Me too, but it was a kind of a heck of a mess to do. You know, so. Okay, and uh, I kind of urge you, um, I'm, I'm kind of like, if I'm going to be a beekeeper, I don't want, I'm, I want to learn there is, I join organizations, I go to meetings, I go to state, a state uh, conventions, I learn a lot, I'm learning all the time, I do this for 20 years, I'm, I learn from other beekeepers, I, I got two beekeeping magazines, I, I should get the library to put them in here. Uh, American Bee Journal is really good. Bee culture is really good. Uh, Bee, American Bee Journal, oh my gosh. Sometimes they're a little, a little bit too advanced. I don't know if you've ever seen a doctorate dissertation of somebody who is, I don't know, studying something, why our bees got yellow legs or something like that. You know, they're doing, this research with numbers and graph and you know it's good for them but for us it's like you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, so anyway yeah, and there's a lot of stuff uh, you can learn about the biology everything is changing there's a lot of new interest in in, in research I like to hear listen to research is one of the best ones I went to was uh, at our state convention, uh, University of Montana uh, researcher there, he was hired as by home, Homeland Security. What does Homeland Security have with people? Well, what what his what he was doing and this is in the battlefield. You can train bees to sniff out roadside bombs. Believe it or not. Oh, yes. And so anyway. Using roadside bombs, which release the bee because the bombs emit an odor. The bees will go there using GPS and infrared spectrophotometry. This will 
kind of show heat, because bees produce heat. They will go on the spot. Uh, uh, image, uh, we call it, the satellites can pick this up within six inches, they can find the roadside bomb. It's better than a, 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 dog, a, a dog sniffing out a bomb, because the bomb goes off, you've got a half a million dollar blood spot there. With the bees, it really doesn't matter. So this is, and you said that's all I, I can tell you. If I tell you anymore, I just stop. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's what he has. But then there's other things that he was saying that this might be used for. A drug, people cooking mess somewhere around. The bees are going to go there, cops zero in on this house that's cooking meth with the odors of it. They're getting busted. Um, car, uh, they call it carpets, I don't want to use that word. Uh, bodies that disappear, you know. Uh, you know, buried in the woods somewhere. You know, people know where, where they're at, you know. For, for identification, you can, uh, they can put that in there and cops can find, uh, you know, a deceased body underground and shallow enough just from the odors of many so. It's kind of strange, you know. Another thing too is, uh, I don't know how they do it, I haven't really read it, but you can buy artificially inseminated queens. Somehow they take uh, ideal queens and, and they get the, and they use microscopes and everything to artificially breed the queens. And that's but these queens are awfully expensive. You ain't gonna pay twenty five dollars a queen, you're gonna pay eight hundred dollars a queen. So how does that make it <laughs> Yeah, right. And then you put it out there and that's my spread is dead, you know. <laughs> if you got that type of money, won't go to you. So I read a lot of books. The library has a lot. Uh beekeeping for dummies is awesome there. Um, the backyard beekeeper is awesome. Uh, you know, you really, and there's a lot more things you can do if you want to tinker around making, use, using your honey for everything under the sun. You can use it for cooking, salad, you know, everything you can make with it. Be, uh, beeswax can be made into a whole bunch of other things. There's books on that. Propolis can be used. So, there's all kinds of stuff. So it's a wide open field. I don't know everything about it, but uh, I'm learning. And it's kind of interesting, you know. So, if you and I think you feel better, more more confident. And I'm willing to help any of you if you need. Uh, just give me a call uh, if you feel uh, for equipment. I always I always kind of shudder when I see somebody opening up their wallet and they buy all of these gadgets and they can get by with it. You know, I would say like smoking material for a little thing. I mean, five dollars for me, five dollars. You know I mean, so I spend it by a fifty-pound bag of it instead of a one-pound bag of it. So, and then I uh, uh, search around the computer. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, different catalogs or, or bee suppliers out there. Uh, they're all over. Uh, just to name a few. Uh, well, like B&B &B is my favorite. Man Lake is a really a good one. That's not, uh, it's up north of the Twin Cities. And they got free free shipping if you buy $100 worth of stuff. So shipping, uh, keep in mind, shipping costs dearly. So if you can buy it locally, you're saving a lot of money. To me, money's important. You know, I mean, I'm not working to just flutter, flutter, flutter it away. And uh, if you buy used equipment, I caution you to look out for it beginning. Uh, I, I, know one, I know one time I went to an auction and uh, my God, they, they drug some, it must have been in a shed and they were halfway robbed as the foundation was shot. They put together the hives. They somebody slapped a nice clean white paint on them, made them look good, but oh man, when you open them up, no, no bee in the right, right mind would want to live in there. <laughs> and uh, I've seen one poor guy just, ah, I'm going to get bee keepers. So he bought had, uh, half a dozen hives that were absolute junk. And I, I, I uh, 
you know, I didn't want to get kicked off the place by disposing mm -hmm. it. But another thing too is you got to watch the use the equipment. A lot of times, years ago, it's just been in there. Some we got fall a fall group in there, and and they said heck with it. Put it in the shed. You know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, auction comes up. They drag it out. Here it is. You might look at it, but it's just full of. You know, that's just like a time tang bomb ready to go off. So, if you use it, so get newer equipment. Uh, uh, if you get good at it and if you want to save money, you can build your own. Some some things you have to buy foundation and frames. But if you're and I got plans. If you'll see me, if you want to do it, I got a couple books of, of different things you can build uh, of hives right and everything. Uh, just make sure, I mean, uh, hives need precision uh, thing. If you really screw up the dimensions of bees, will fill it full of wax or propolis. So kind of, kind of a don't, uh, I guess it's called hive standards. Everything is right to the right dimension. So. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you so much for coming.